to the Screen Junkies Movie Fights Extravaganza benefiting women in film. It is gonna be an awesome event. And thank you so much to you out there. We almost lost a light, but it's gonna work out. Thanks to you, we have raised over $36,000 for women in film. They advocate for women in the entertainment industry, and that's what we are all about tonight. It's gonna be a great night of fights, including some of your hosts. Roxy Stryer is here. Woo! So excited, yeah, thank you guys. Sasha Pro Raver. I am so excited to be here. The epic return of Alicia Malone in a classic. Hi, everyone. Daniel Radford with all the judging. Hello. Judge, judge, judge. And you know what? You can still donate. Go to screenjunkies.com backslash charity event, capital C, capital E. You can donate and people are. So we're gonna do a special shout out to Cameron Lindsay, $500 yeah. donation. Yeah. Steven Degada, Leah Fritz, yeah. watching from Europe. Thank you so much. We'll be calling you out throughout the night. It's gonna be a great show. Hal Rudnick is here and here's a little bit of what you can expect. This is Screen Junkies Movie Fights, a battlefield of cinephile debate where winners find glory through facts, passion, creativity, and sometimes because they shouted loudest. Tonight, gear up for the single biggest movie fights event of all time, where challengers from across the internet will gather for an extravaganza to benefit women in film. Fan favorites will duke it out in two lightning quick glass fighter standing gauntlet. Things get critical when some of the best movie critics in the biz turn their critical eye on each other. Gather your magical girl pals and crank it over 9,000 because it's the first ever anime fight. Never before, never again, our two-time Emmy-nominated Honest Trailers team goes head to head. Pride is on the line as Nerdist, Hyper Heroes, and Rotten Tomatoes wage war over the future of the MCU. From movie talk to movie fights, it's a collider collision as Collider collides. Young Lions, Cucumber, and Chunk step into the ring with veteran ring general Hashtag Botanicus Mike Carlson. Living legend Alicia Malone returns to oversee a family feud in the equally legendary House Malton. Plus, Doug loves movie fights. Nick Mundy gets raw. Scoops McGee breaks the news. TV and gamer fights return for one night only. You made this show possible. You made it happen. So sit back, strap in, and get ready for Movie Fights Extravaganza. And now your host for the first fight of the night, Hal Rudnick. What's going on, everybody? It is the Movie Fights Live Hashtag Women in Film Extravaganza. And what better way to start off the Women in Film Extravaganza than with four dudes? Yes! <laughs> yeah. Um, the first fight in the greatest crossover in history. Uh, here it is. Uh, I can't believe these three guys, Spencer Gilbert, Joe Starr, Dan Merle, I give you a round of applause. Um, the, the men behind Honest Trailers. Uh, uh, you've never fought before, and we're going to Not movie on fight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you fight all the time when you're yeah. writing out oh, trailers. Yeah. Yes. Rumble every Thursday yeah. afternoon before uh, movie fights. But you three have not movie fought against each other, and we're going to do that right now. Are you feeling it? Are you ready? Let's do this. Can't Roth, wait to take Danielle, this dive. you guys feeling it? We're feeling all of you men. You're our favorite men. No. No. My it. Thank you. <laughs> all I'm right. All the men. Uh, guys, here's the dumb question. What's the dumbest movie ever made? That is the question. Spencer Gilbert, let's start with you. My movie's called Tammy and the T-Rex, Hal. It's an unseen gem, and to explain why it's dumb, I'll just start briefly by explaining the human brain to you guys. You see, the brain is composed of three distinct layers. On the outside, you have the human brain, responsible for reasoning, poetry, philosophy, art. You have the mammalian brain, with, which has just some more basic socialization aspects. But then at the core, at the dumbest part of us all, you have the lizard brain, just responsible for fight, flight, and fornication. And no movie speaks to those basic instincts more than Tammy and the T-Rex. I'll explain more later, but what's your pick, Joe? Uh, first of all, I, I just really appreciate that Dan started taking notes immediately as you just started describing the human brain. So I'm really, I want to see how that comes into play. Uh, I'm working on a thesis. <laughs> Once upon a time, a, um, a dumb man who doesn't know anything about dwarves decided to 
write a drama about a family of dwarves, uh, except for one son played by Matthew McConaughey. Uh, this was a very dumb idea. That movie's called Tiptoes. A bunch of A-list <laughs> actors. <laughs> yep. A bunch, of, a bunch of A-list actors and talents looked at this script and they said, yeah, okay. Uh, which was dumb. Um, and I then want the they, tagline. It's the little things. It's in the life little things matter. in life. Uh, very dumb tagline. Thank you, Spencer. <laughs> um, and then they cast Peter Dinklage in this movie about dwarves. But instead of making him the lead, a very dumb agent called Gary Oldman and said, "Here's how we're going to give you an Oscar. You're going to sit around and walk on your knees with a bad mullet wig next to Peter Dinklage." And in a very dumb decision, Gary Oldham said, "Yeah, okay. Tiptoes." Tiptoes from Joe Starr, Dan Merle, dumbest movie ever made. Uh, Aaron Eckhart, to quote him from The Dark Knight, once said, <laughs> you either die a hero or you live long enough to become the villain. And that's what I think of every time I think of my pick for the dumbest movie ever made, the fourth film in the Jaws franchise, Jaws the Revenge. This time, it's personal. <laughs> <laughs> there is so much about this movie that is mind-numbingly dumb that I can't wait to get into, and uh, I, I just let's just continue with the fight so I can get to how many ways this movie is the stupidest, dumbest movie ever made. Heck yeah, mix it up, fellas. I'd like to, because no one, let's be real, no one's seen Tammy and the T-Rex, this is an unearthed gem, I'd like to very quickly run you guys through the plot, if I could. Yeah, Because this movie it. stars uh, Tammy, a pre-fame Denise Richards, mm -hmm. and Mike, a pre-fame uh, Paul Walker, and uh, the week, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the weekend at Bernie's guy. Uh, <laughs> It's a love triangle between uh, uh, Tammy, Mike, and Billy, her abusive ex-boyfriend. Mm. Uh, uh, Mike and Billy get in a fight where all they do is squeeze each other's testicles for about five minutes straight. JT, I believe we have a clip. Oh, we can do clips. We can do clips. <laughs> no one told me to do clips. I was not told about clips. <laughs> So you after that, uh, 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 Paul Walker is uh, abducted by Billy and the gang and left in a <laughs> the town's local wild animal sanctuary where he's mauled by a lion. JT, I believe we have a clip. Wait, <laughs> now this is not fair. <laughs> yeah. Spencer specifically today said, I wish we had clips yeah, so we could show classic misdirection, man. Yeah. Yeah. Spencer's also saying, let me movie fight like no one's ever movie fought before. Uh, at that point, his mauled body's uh, abducted by Dr. Watchenstein, uh, where he's put in an animatronic dinosaur. Uh, one thing leads to another, he becomes a dinosaur. Uh, he reunites with his girlfriend Tammy, who doubts that it's him until he does his signature move, which is to eat flowers. I it's hard to explain, but just watch. You're crazy. That's, you know so that. there's Paul Walker doing it, and there's the dinosaur doing it, so you what know you it's gotta be the right. same guy. <laughs> All right, Spencer. Spencer, are you done monopolizing the? Clock? I got one more. Just then. No, well, you know, fine, fine. You know, go ahead. I've taken up enough time. You know what? In 1994, it was a smart idea to do. Combine dinosaurs and dumb Polly Shore comedy because the two biggest things in the world were Jurassic Park and friggin' Polly Shore. Combine those two ideas. That's a where's Polly Shore? A, it's Paul Walker. How dare you besmirch style, his good name? Style of comedy. I understand that uh, Paul Walker's mom did not uh, dominate the LA comedy scene for years and years, and then let her son make son-in-law. Inside but dick. But these are like these are uh, <laughs> these are th this is a good these are good things to combine in 1994, and they did a competent job doing it. They didn't do a dumb job. They did a, uh, they did uh, an okay uh, job. You know what? That ball grab joke it ends with Paul Walker saying I was wearing a cup and that that's dumb it's a well complete it's not a well it's a completed joke whereas <laughs> whereas whereas tiptoes is just dumb tiptoes does not even get to I was wearing a cup <laughs> tiptoes is just the ball grab but for 90 the, minutes that's the problem tiptoes is actually like a pretty nuanced uh, interesting movie they is just it? happened to cast Gary Oldman that's the only dumb thing about it no no otherwise no, no. there are multiple three-dimensional little people characters which is more than you you can say about most movies. There's no nuance to a scene where someone says uh, to a pregnant woman, hey, have you been drinking? Of course not, I'm I'm pregnant. And then there's a, a 30 second pause and then she says, do you wanna go get some drinks? And then they go, yes, this movie was not written. It was just, it was just made somehow, uh, know, which that, is that which sounds is like dumb. a completed joke to me, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, ah, turn about. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, there's uh, Jaws the Revenge. Jaws the Revenge. Jaws yes. the, well, Can I speak about Jaws the Revenge may. a little you bit? May, first of, of all. course. Sure. Okay. Spencer took us through a symposium uh, on his movie. Uh, yes, exactly. I, my movie's so dumb, I don't need clips. I can just <laughs> tell you how stupid it is. Uh, Jaws the Revenge is about the wife of Roy Scheider's character from the first movie, <laughs> who the, the the shark kills one of their sons, and he she goes with the other son to the Bahamas. I looked this up, 1,038 nautical miles away, and the shark somehow follows them there. 
it's never explained how or why a shark can navigate from the northeast part of the United States to the Bahamas. Secondly, this shark, again, not the same shark, not even the second or third same shark from the other movies, somehow has made it personal against the people in this movie, who, by the way, have done nothing to any of the other sharks in the franchise. So even if you're gonna grant the right that the concept of a shark wanting revenge on somebody is not the dumbest premise of all time, even the revenge itself is dumb because he's going after people that didn't do anything to it. Well, they're related. It's the and stupidest they're... idea in the history of it's movies. It's not dumb, Dan, it's nuanced. I like that they don't hit you. They don't hit you over the head with the shark's connection to the widow. They they just they they hint there at it. There is no connection. Well, Dan, Dan, a Dan. dumb movie would have like a dead zone moment where the shark and the lady look at each other and you're like, oh, I get it. They're psychically connected. This movie just no, that would bring a shred of logic it. to this. Dan, you're a, you're a brilliant film critic and a very perceptive man. I'm shocked that you missed the subtext of this whole movie. The shark is Thank a you. metaphor. This is a woman's grief following her across the ocean. This yeah. is really. Even though really? she's trying to get away, really? it ain't her husband, so the shark you're is her me, grief. You're telling me if you steer a sailboat into the side of grief, it explodes for no reason! Sometimes yes. it does. Yes. We no all have our process. Time! Time! Oh my gosh, wow. Three super dumb movies. I feel like Are Spencer you... got twice the time to speak as either <laughs> one of did, us. He did, but he didn't bring clips. You know, bang your shoe on the table if you don't like it. You just let him go host a PowerPoint presentation. You're the host, Hal. That's your job, not mine. You know what? Uh, I'm, I let him argue. So, you know what? I thought... I, 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 uh, so, uh, from where I'm sitting, uh, Spencer knocked you out with his lovely metaphor, Dan. I'm so sorry. That that shark was a woman's pain. It was the Babadook of Michael Caine. That's the a Babadook good movie. of Michael Caine. 30 seconds I got to speak about my movie. I'm surprised I didn't find you over, Hal. Uh, and, uh... Uh, the the uh, y your movie was super dumb, and your movie was super dumb. I feel like Joe put the uh, Joe squashed you with that uh, Jurassic Park Pauly Shore comment. That what what you saw in that movie was in the Zeitgeist. I give it to Joe and tiptoes. Oh. Let's go to let's go to Roth. Yes. Well, I think the facts are good. How, as far as I can tell, that uh -huh. is in fact how sharks biologically operate um, <laughs> as metaphor. Uh -huh. uh, I gotta say, I'm very That's torn because here. Spencer, I thought, lost the fight by enticing me to see his film with those clips mm -hmm. a little bit, but then he came back and gave a hard knock to Dan, who had all that passion. I gotta say, Dan's passion won me over. I'm going Dan. All right, oh. it's 1-1, one, one. Wow. Joe and Dan, Joe and Dan, Danielle. Oh, I hate this. Um, first of all, all of your movies are dumb, and I'm gonna watch all of them this weekend. <laughs> yeah, this is a good film me. festival. You know who I am. Um, I, you know, Dan, his point about the shark stalker is a very strong point. Like, how does a shark st stalk someone? But that metaphor about a woman's grief really, um, really got me. I have to go with Spencer. Mm. Ooh, right. it's three. A tie. Wow. Three tie. We have a three-way tie. Three we three didn't tie. play. Do we have a tiebreaker? Do we have a tiebreaker? <laughs> <laughs> Billy, what do we do? <laughs> Billy, is there a tiebreaker? You decide how. Okay. You know what? I'm going to go with the guy I picked initially. <laughs> Knock it out, Joe. Oh, three smart guys, three dumb movies. Congratulations, Joe. We'll do uh, it again. Joe, you have honest trailer bragging rights. And you know what? Today is a spectacular, momentous day. We're catching up with friends, old and new. And we have a little bit of something from, oh, a good friend of ours who's about to get a little bit raw. Give it up for Nick Mundy, everybody! Yay! Welcome! And welcome to a very special episode of Monday Night Raw. My name is Nick Mundy, and never say you can't make a comeback for charity, and only for charity. Uh, with me, as always, is my very, very special boy. Uh, I miss him. I've been writing letters to him. He finally responded. Mr. Dan Merle. Hey, Nick. Hey! Good to see you. You too. It's been like two years, it for has. real. It's, it, has, it has been. This is kind of like a recurring nightmare that I've had. I know. Yeah, so we're doing a Monday Night Raw. Look at that. Who would yeah. have thought we'd ever do this again? Yeah, the only way this could be a worse idea is if you made a stand and there was only two of us. You ruined movie fights. 
I, we changed it back. I think we should start the show. Let's do it. Let's start it. Uh, Dan, I guess we're reviewing a movie because that's what we do here. That is what we did. Uh, well, well, Infinity War's out. All right. So let's, well, why don't we review Infinity War, you and me? How about this? Like old times. All right. Avengers Infinity War, of course, as you know, is in theaters now. It had the biggest opening weekend of any movie, uh, globally or uh, domestically of all time, directed by the Russo brothers, who, as you know, did uh, Captain America, The Winter Soldier, uh, and uh, this is the culmination of 10 years of Marvel movies. Uh, this is, of course, an adaptation of the, of the very popular... What are, you, what are you doing, Nick? What do you mean? What's with the... What's this? It's a Finney Gauntlet. <laughs> That's okay. That's the Infinity... Okay. Yeah, do you want people to see this? We're, I'm making the thumbnail for the show. Oh, okay. Do you yeah. want people to see this thing? Uh, I do. It is for charity. So yeah, yes. it's for charity. This is how people see stuff through the thumbnail. Every other f movie boy is doing the Thanos glove thing in the thumbnail. Okay. Do you want people to see this or not, man? I do, okay. I yeah. know I haven't been two years as the place is going to Yes. But I'm trying to get the thumbnail done, man. Okay. That's that's fine. All right, no, you continue know, reviewing the movie. I, I don't a... have patience for this stuff. That's fine. You, it's for you're right. You're no. right. So keep do as you're we're doing. We're just okay. we're just. I mean, it's Infinity Gauntlet, man. So uh, Josh Brolin uh, is uh, plays Thanos, the wielder of the Infinity Gauntlet. Uh, he has uh, in search of the Infinity Stones, which are magical gems that will give him unlimited uh, power across the galaxy. Now, what I. What I really okay. What is this, Nick? What do you? What do you? <laughs> why are you stopping? It's very. I, I don't know what you're doing. Is it's, why. What if Logan was in the Affinity War thumbnail, man? This is a supplementary video. Do you want views, man? Yes, I do. I do. Do you know how YouTube algorithms work? I don't. No if one does. There you see Logan Claus in the, the thumbnails. JT, get this close up, and then Infinity War text in bold letters, and some guys like, and then another one's like. Come on, I mean, have you seen your channel? I have. All right, Infinity War, Logan, thumbnail, JT, one, two, three, picture, ah! What would you give this movie? I, you know, I really like this movie. I thought that it was a good addition to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I'm gonna give it a, a solid B plus. All right, yeah, I thought the movie, JT hit it! Nick Mundy, National Treasure, boom. Glad to see you, my pal. All right, it's time for the first speed round gauntlet of this behemoth. Okay, so here's how it works. I will throw out a donor submitted question. Thank you for submitting your questions. Each person, first person to answer will speak and then will we'll speak first and then they'll have 20 seconds, 20 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds 20, 20. rebuttal. Okay, 20, 20 and then 10, 10. And then uh, we're gonna go through this all night long. You are the first match of the gauntlet. I will decide the winners and uh, yeah, this is so exciting. We've got Schmodown champ Champion, Brianne Chandler yeah. versus yeah. Spider-Man Homecoming's Tony Revolori! Yeah. Wow, all Super right. Yes. Superstar. Yes, superstar indeed. <laughs> all right. Um, lady, gentlemen, yes. here yes. is your question. Submitted by Brian Burton. What failed, either critically or commercially, what failed movie, either critically or commercially, most is in most need of a remake? What failed movie is in most need of a remake? <sighs> TikTok, we only have three hours. <laughs> so we have as much time as the Oscars. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Green Lantern. Green Lantern? Labyrinth? Is that a failed one? Uh. How about you clue? know what? That's what you said. Labyrinth. Okay, we'll go with it. Great. All right. We heard Green Lantern first. Tony is arguing for Green Lantern. Brienne for Labyrinth. Twenty seconds begin, Tony. Whenever you speak. Ryan Reynolds is perfect as Deadpool, but he missed the mark uh, as Hal Jordan and Green Lantern. I would love to see Green Lantern uh, come back with uh, 
uh, uh, uh, John Stewart um, and have someone like Idris Elba come in and re uh, uh, invigorate the franchise of the Green Lantern because they are such an iconic part. Of Time. Twenty seconds. Okay. Brienne. Um, so Labyrinth. Uh, it's a great classic from the '80s that I feel could be updated, especially with its uh, special effects. And I find that it would be interesting. It's, it's somewhat of a musical, and I would like to t take it even more into the musical genre and make it like a Greatest Showman Labyrinth because I love Greatest Showman. And um, I would just like to see something a little more showy. <laughs> Ten second rebuttal. Labyrinth will never be better than what it was with David Bowie in that. So you can never remake that movie because David Bowie is great. Green Lantern needs to be made because it was a terrible movie and it needs to be remade so that way the DC. It was a terrible movie. Um, therefore, I feel like it doesn't really need to be remade because we have so much superhero saturation. I would just like to see something different for once that goes back to our roots of um, originality. Time! Wow, what a battle. I love the idea of Idris Elba as the Jon Stewart Green Lantern. I hate the idea of Greatest <laughs> Showman Labyrinth. <laughs> Tony yes! takes it! Yes! <laughs> All right. You know, uh, <laughs> I've had a lot of fun already, guys. But uh, we're celebrating an amazing cause, and now the women of Screen Junkies are going to break it down and tell you... Oh, what's that? What's the that? Multiple fighters. Multiple oh, all right! Greer. Can I... Can hey, I... Greer, get over here! <laughs> you know what? We're working one live man, without a man. net, folks! Oh, gosh. All right. Oh, uh, gosh, this is a Ed true Greer, gauntlet. welcome to the party, pal. Oh, man. All right. Tony versus Ed, gauntlet, gauntlet. I'm this coming is for you, submitted. Mark. This is submitted by our own Keith Richmond. What else? Keith? Keith Richard watches the show? No, no, oh, yes. Keith Richards and Mick Jagger watch the show all Incredible. the time. Incredible. Keith Richmond asks, what is the best movie musical ever made? The Greatest Showman! <laughs> <laughs> no help from the peanut gallery. <clears throat> Uh, I'll say Chicago. Chicago. I'm gonna go Greece. Greece! We have Chicago versus Greece. Ed, you spoke first. 20 seconds begin whenever you speak now. I think, A, uh, Chicago is even more relevant now because uh, we're more into female issues and whatnot. And the uh, the contrast between uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones' character and Renee Zellweger's character in far, as far as how they live life and how they learn from each other in the jail experience, I think that was really great. Also, uh, it's got great songs, even songs by other people like Mr. Cellophane by, uh, by John C. Riley. I remember that, that's crazy. Time. <laughs> Grease is a timeless classic that will never, ever be out of style. People watch it to this day, every year, every month. People love this movie. Um, you have John Travolta in the height of his fame and Olivia Newton-John creating songs that are incredible uh, at the height of John Travolta's fame. And the, the, the musical is just something that you always wanna have in your heart because it's so warm and, 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 and helpful. I think it was very warm and helpful when you hear the lyrics of, tell me more, tell me more, did she put up a fight? <laughs> it's like, oh my God, did she put up a fight on this date? Wow, were you defeated? <sighs> 10 seconds begins. <clears throat> um... Chicago is a movie that I don't even know because Grease is something that kids watch even nowadays. It's on Broadway. Chicago is nowhere near, so it's not as great. Time! I gotta give it to Ed Greer for the strong female characters that he described and knocking down Grease for a questionable lyric. Tony Revolori, thanks for shopping, pal. All right. Uh, let's welcome to the chair, Riley Silverman. Gauntlet, gauntlet, gauntlet. By the way, spin the difference, Grease 2. Oh. <laughs> Strong female characters, a Batman style character, and, and a Adrian's song about Med. sex and bees. Adrian's yeah. Med is in that. Yeah. Okay, this, is, this question, uh, Ed, Riley, ready to do battle. <sighs> Fiona Henderson submitted, what is the best Edgar Wright movie? Shaun of the Dead. Okay, so then I have to go uh, Scott Pilgrim. All right, Sean versus Scott. Ed spoke first. 20 seconds begin when you speak now. 
Shaun of the Dead did not fall into the same traps as a lot of other comedy horror movies. I think they established the rules of the reality fairly quickly, and I think every time that they do something silly with the zombie concept, it's a metaphor for something in reality, i.e. The, the grogginess of everybody in the morning, that, that whole sequence, the throwing the records. You know, th there's a lot of things in there that are really cool. It's a great zombie movie and a great comedy movie. He's great. Riley. Three words for you, Mary Elizabeth Winstead. That's my first thing. Ramona Flowers, lots of crazy hair colors, lots of fun to watch. Also, just a lot of fun taking like the idea of a video game movie, which we have seen tried over and over again and failed. And instead we take a movie that's based on a comic book, but uses all the video game tropes in a way that actually like is really engaging and interesting and kind of challenges the genre a little bit, breaks the fourth wall. Rebuttal. I would certainly give uh, Scott Kilmer a certain amount of credit as far as being uh, trying to be somewhat an innovative movie, but to take your rightful place on the throne of one of the best zombie movies of all time after all the other zombie movies have come out and a comedy? Come on, man. Listen, but Scott Pilgrim has to line up itself against all of Edgar Wright's other exes and defeat them in battle, and that's what it goes <laughs> forth and does and fights its own self at the end, just like Scott fighting his own self. You two made this very hard for me, and I don't like that. But uh, I, I gotta go. I gotta go, Ed. As oh yeah, far of course as, you do. <laughs> as far as the as far as the better film yeah, overall, because it's, it's not even an argument. That's the better movie by far. But it comes down to the arguments. <laughs> yeah. He spoke faster, so I let him. Uh, Riley, don't sell yeah. yourself short. You yeah. were strong. Ed was just stronger. Of course Thank you, was. Riley. No. Thanks for shopping. All right, Ed, get ready to face the formidable Jay Washington. Here we go, buddy. It's the Hulk versus the Thing. Here we go. Here we All go. All right, Jay, I like, like that bull's hat. I just came back from Chicago. you damn right. Dude, if I get right on. Bullshit. Jack See? Kirby should draw this match, is all I'm saying. <laughs> all right, look here. The Hulk versus the Thing. Okay, um, this question is submitted by Roman Kaufman. What was the worst performance to win Best Actor or Actress Oscar? Al Pacino and Son of a Woman. Al Pacino and Son of a Woman? Jay? Did he win for Hurricane? Five. Best actress? Or actor? Uh, Five. Halle Berry, Monsters Ball. Halle Berry versus Al Pacino, a match made in Hades! You spoke first. <laughs> Ed. There was a time when Al Pacino was one of our greatest actors, but during this period, he slipped into a very, a very, uh, dinner theater style of acting <laughs> where he just sort of screamed everything as though it was important and that movie was was very emblematic of that Hoo -ah! and, was, and we know that Denzel Washington got jobbed out that year because he was he was the best actor that year so um, most people agree that that at least Denzel got jobbed out when it comes to Halle Berry and Monsters Ball, we just more so connect her to Billy Bob Thornton. We connect her performance being horrid, especially the fact like she did losing Isaiah. It was just a sequel to doing that performance. We wanted better, which we ended up getting better out of Halle Berry. Granted, she had the fallback with Catwoman, but that fact that Monsters Ball is, Daddy make me feel good. Everybody hated that, but just like to see the scene with the two of them together. Al Pacino does Al Pacino, which is drugs. Now when you come- Time. <laughs> Rebuttal. Uh my rebuttal would be that, uh, yes, Halle Berry's performance was horrid, but the very fact that there was a big, uh, I don't, I don't want to hate to say it, but a diversity push, and she got she got put over, but it was a Lifetime Achievement Award for Al Pacino. Al Pacino started going on that downward slide. He did Sin of a Woman. He had the performance at any given Sunday, but Halle Berry elevated her claims until she got to Catwoman, which we all want burned to the stake and act like it never happened. But when it comes to Halle Berry's performances, you want to... Wow, what a col what a collision. Uh, yeah, you're right, Catwoman is bad, but Al Pacino's performance in Scent of the Woman is the one uh, that takes the day right here. Uh, yeah, we talked a little too much about Halle Berry's other films, uh, and you're absolutely right, Denzel deserved it for Malcolm X that year. Ed Greer takes it! See you later, Ben Grimm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, because the, the thing always loses. Get out of here. Um. <laughs> the last fight of this riveting gauntlet will involve Mr. Mark Andreco and Ed Greer. I knew it was today. Right, sir. All right. The final question okay. of the gauntlet is submitted by Paige Brigante. What form of animation lends itself better for film? 2D hand-drawn or 3D CG? Hand-drawn. Hand-drawn from the comic book artist. That leaves you with th uh, 3D CG, Ed? 
Formulate your opinion. Mark and Draco spoke first. 20 seconds begins when you speak. CG is great for environments and symmetrical things, but in real life, living creatures aren't symmetrical and it becomes very cold and very distant. I would much rather watch Beauty and the Beast or Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs than Toy Story any day of the week because there's, it's almost like Ray Harryhausen special effects. You like the human touch. The imperfections make it feel more, more real and more present. There's a, ster there's a sterility to CG. And records have a richer sound than CDs or MP3s. I mean, come on. I, I just feel as though the advancements that are in 3D animation, when you see The Incredibles, especially even The Incredibles 2, the things that they're able to do with the textures that they're able to to, to do with uh, CGI, I mean, I just think they're superior to a lot of hand-drawn animation, which tends to be a little bit repetitive, even in the best examples of it. So I do believe that the environments it might be so it might be uh, sleeker and more uh, more polished but if you're talking about records being archaic you know what outsold CDs and DVDs and digital last year vinyl so sometimes the original is the best one I think the need to go back to butter churns and things of this nature is is, is part of us. We're, we're, we're an anachronistic people. But in reality, as far as movie animation, I do believe the CGI is is superior at this point. Ooh, body blows and, and roundhouses. What a battle that was. At the end of the day, I gotta go Ed Greer. Whoa. That's dangerous. They're gonna say it's fixed. I already see it on the internet. Lost, baby. He had you with he had you with record sales, but you came back with the butter churns. And you know what? I thought your first <laughs> I, th I thought your I thought your first round argument really was uh, set up uh, something fairly unbeatable. Wow, that is the gauntlet. Let's hear it for all of our gauntlet Jesus. competitors. Insanity, Mark and Draco. Well done. I'll be at the bar. Okay. <laughs> You'll get to You know what? You might have deja vu. Thank you, Ed. Ed, excellent. Ed, come over here and hang out with me while I read this. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Um, so, Ed, it's been such a great night already. Wouldn't you agree? I think so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Get uh, find your uh, find your camera. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Um, but uh, you know, I want to learn a little bit more about this night, and the women of Screen Junkies are going to break down what exactly the Women in Film organization is and what they're all about. Uh, they put together a sweet video. Let's check it out. I'm a member of Women in Film and one of the many reasons that I love being part of this group is because it has a great networking vibe. There are always screenings, events, mixes, and it's a chance for people who are up and coming in the industry to actually get to meet their mentors. This business can be incredibly difficult to break into, but a lot of times the best way to get into the door is if someone else sees you and says, I'm going to show you how to get this done. I'm going to take you under my wing. When you have something set into place where it's women helping women, it's women that are already there opening the space wider for someone next to them. And that person then widens the space for somebody else underneath them. Women in Film does so many things. Your money goes to so many different places. And one of the places that I think is most important is their hotline so that if they are being sexually harassed in their workplace, they have somebody to talk to. They are building a foundation for women to feel supported. I think it's just absolutely invaluable for women to know that these programs exist. And if you have Women in Film doing things like offering film financing workshops, whether they're giving finishing funds for movies that maybe just couldn't quite cross that finish line. They're gonna provide several filmmakers with the money to actually finish their film. That's what gets it into festivals. That's what gets their career going. That's what gets us to be able to see the film in the first place. Or if it's a mentorship program where you get to speak to another producer who maybe has walked this road before and can teach you things you didn't know yet. And people need that information a lot of times just how to navigate the business itself more than they need the idea. I could, I could use both, frankly. Those are just a few things that Women in Film does. Thank you so much for your support, and thanks for watching. Thank you guys so much for your support. You are literally the best. What a great cause and what a great night. I'm Sasha Pearl Raver coming to you from deep in the Movie Fight studio and I am joined by your hyper nerd fighters who are coming up next. We've got Dan Casey, Jacqueline Coley, Hector Navarro, and of course we got our judgy girl, 
Hey, girly. <laughs> we got some major controversy on this couch. Let's talk Ladies about it. Ladies and gentlemen, how do we feel about that first gauntlet? Because there was that. I did not see that coming. That stressed me out. That stressed me out, Sasha. It stressed me out a lot. I feel like you also had a lot of questions and answers. Oh, the Hunter. animation round? I saw a vein pop out of his neck. That was a completely unfair BS question. Whoever, I, I know <laughs> I know we love the Screen Junkies fans, but whoever asked that, it's just a medium. That was BS. That was total BS. So unfair. what's the answer? Both. Both. Come on. The greatest animated film of all time, The Iron Giant, has a CG character at the center of it. It depends on how you use it. It's all depending on how you use it, people. Coco. These the are gauntlets being you thrown know. down again. <laughs> people. Uh, and Jacqueline, you got extremely upset about the mention of The Greatest Showman. Oh, Lord. The McDonald's of musicals? I'm sorry, Brianne. <laughs> I appreciate you, sis. Mac. But that movie is like, you know what it is, though? It's so the boyfriend that I broke up with because I hated that movie when it came out. And then he just keeps getting hotter and get better girlfriends because that movie made so much money. It's McDonald's a musical. Quit eating it. Quit ingesting this awful movie. I don't Sorry. know what Jacqueline's talking about because chicken Sorry. nuggets are yummy and that sweet and sour <laughs> sauce. Dan Casey, how are you feeling about going into this next fight? How do you feel about this whole day in general? Scent of a woman? <laughs> I don't have a sense of smell, so I can't relate to any of them. I'm feeling great. I'm happy to be here. Women in Film is a wonderful cause. I'm happy to be a part of this, raising awareness for a fantastic organization. Well, how about going up against these fighters? Who do you feel most intimidated by? Um... Well, I've had it. There. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I had a dream about this. Uh, um, I feel intimidated by both of them for different reasons because I respect them very much and I know that each one of them is going to smack me down in a way that will just like leave a lasting mark. Uh, so some sort of like weird centaur hybrid of the two of them. I have a feeling that when I try to make a very good real reasoned argument, it's just going to get eviscerated like so many Hulks and so many old man Logans. Wow. That was That's beautiful. almost There's... like the sweetest thing too. See? Look at all this love before it goes down. Now, where can the good people find you if they have something to say about your fight. Oh, no. You can find me online at Dan Casey. Also, buy my brand new Star Wars book in stores now. Yeah. <laughs> Jacqueline. I'm that Jacqueline because I'm that girl on the internet, so it's pretty easy to find me anywhere there. Hector. I'm at Hector is funny because I assumed white people wouldn't remember my last name. <laughs> at Hector is funny. <laughs> I never can remember that. And now, Not gonna you lie. guys have to stay Same tuned. We've I'm got a Jacqueline. ton more fights. You have to find out who's going to get the new Movie Fights Championship belt. But before we do any of that, we're going to throw it over to our girl, Roxy, who's got our anime fight. Take it, girl. Yeah. Sasha, thank you so much, my love. Thank you, Nerd Fighters, for that. The Greatest Showman has never been talked about so much ever before, especially when it wasn't even fought in a round. <laughs> Where it will not be talked about is here for Are anime fight. Showman? Aren't you prepared for that? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I know all about P.T. Barnum, Bethel, Connecticut, Solidarity Man. That's I where he was born. That's where I was born. Think what? The, the best number from that is uh, the other side. I know that the Zendaya number. Yeah, I'm sorry. Who knew that it opened up such a can of worms? It was just supposed to be a transition, yeah, guys. It's getting... the greatest show. Although, Although it would make an amazing fight today. Guys, I'm Roxy Stryer, in case you forgot, because we haven't been here in a little bit, alongside Emma Five. Hello, happy to be here. And Erica Ishii. Hello. Talking about some anime, and we've got some great nerds on the couch to do my job for me, because they know all about anime. It's Max Song. Yay, Max. Yay. Hello. And you know him, you love him. It's Joe Star. Hey. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. All right, I guys. I shouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be here. You're what? great at this. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy, he's got the vin, and they got the vin. Joe, I what's your favorite scared. anime? Oh, my God. You put him on the spot, and he folded. You have at least, oh, like, no. seven and a half minutes to no, think no, about no. it. No. Yes. Okay, okay, let's get into the actual fight, because All we're not right. here to see Joe stumble over what his favorite anime is. We're here to talk about what is the best anime series of all time. Time, Emma, we are starting with you. All right, listen, guys, there have been many fantastic anime series over the years. A lot of people have a lot of nostalgia for, like, 80s anime and 90s anime, but let me take you back to the year 1977. We're actually beginning with the manga. The anime started in 1978. This is the year that Star Wars was released, but also one of the most important space operas of all time, Galaxy Express 3-9. This is the coming-of-age journey of young Tetsuro, who finds a way to get himself a ticket on board the Galaxy Express 39, which is a train that goes throughout the universe with the help of a mysterious, beautiful woman named Maytel, uh, who, uh, you know, has some deep, dark secrets, obviously, like you do. And it's a journey through the galaxy to 
ultimately get what everybody wants, which is a machine body. Through a machine body, you're able to preserve all of your thoughts and emotions and essentially achieve immortality. Of course, along his journey, stopping at many different planets along the way, Tetsuro realizes that getting a machine body might not be all it's cracked up to be, which is a hard lesson that I think all of us need to learn. This is truly a series that is ahead of its time, that in addition to being a coming of age story, really warns against the troubles of capitalism. Okay, Erica. First of all, I'd like to bring out a gift for us to share because at the end of the Aww. day, we're just two girls that are really happy to be talking about anime because, like, who you didn't, I didn't get to do this in high school, man. Here, yeah, man. Pocky. Okay, super. Um, it's a good so flavor, too. I decided to go with Cowboy Bebop, which is the adventure of the bounty hunter crew of the Bebop. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate space western. I'm a brown coat, and yes, I still think that is the case. Uh, so, the Cowboy Bebop is the best of both Eastern and Western storytelling. Each episode is a perfect standalone narrative, but with a beautiful overarching uh, character arc. So you can really see each of them on their own, but taken as an aggregate, you get a really lovely character development. Um, it's an incredible ensemble cast. The animation is great. They poured tons of money into the animation and into the soundtrack. The soundtrack is incredible and iconic. Yoko Kano and the seatbelts, jazz, and, and, it's, and it's so beautiful uh, and, and timeless, more than anything, timeless. Uh, also, uh, the voice acting, both in the Japanese original and in the English dubbing, they took time and money in order to make it quality. This is the kind of stuff that is used as the bar for dubbing um, to this day. Uh, also, I, it's, it's, Galaxy Express is fantastic in that it was ahead of its time, as, as you said, uh, but it was still very early in devel the development of the medium. The animation itself is not very great. The voice acting is not great. The uh, uh, In the, the English version, I would like to point out the Japanese the, even version. The, even in the original no. Japanese. I'm sorry, um, are you arguing that Masako Nozawa, the voice of Tetsuro, also the voice of Goku, is not a good voice actor? No. no. I didn't this say is that. The, She's not a no, good voice actor. No, I'm sorry. Actor. This is the series that gave us Masako Nozawa. It is literally worth watching this movie in Japanese simply for her performance. She is one of the great voice actors of all time. Nobody is going to argue that she is not one of the best in the business. She is this the was, eternal boy. Unless she okay, is going to so argue here's the that. thing. The thing is, is it's not about her performance. It's about the quality of the dubbing. They didn't have the time to match the lip flap because like the way that anime was dubbed in the olden days is they just kind of play it back and like hope for the best that they caught something um, because the quality of, of the, the tape would degrade the more that you go back and try and dub it better. And so if you watch it, it's not about her performance. It's about the quality, like the, the lip flaps just okay, doesn't so match. Okay, so the lip flaps and, don't quite match up. That doesn't change the fact that she gives an incredibly emotional performance as Tetsuro. Tetsuro is very much the heart of the entire Matsumoto verse. And that is the thing is that Leiji Matsumoto, the creator of Galaxy Express 39, has an entire body of work that is all centered around this. You know, it started with he created Space Battleship Yamato back in 1974, and then in 1977 launched both Galaxy Express 39 and so Captain Harlock, the, the original is, cool anime guy. Come on. So you can take a look at the aggregate of Galaxy Express and all the different films and like the 113 plus episodes of, of the TV. But if you look at Cowboy Bebop, up in its 26 perfect episodes with one movie, the qu quantity and, and broadness of the universe does not necessarily equal quality are, are overall. Are we not going to talk about the fact there's a black exploitation episode of Cowboy Bebop? Yeah, absolutely. Cowboy Bebop is a love letter to Western cinema. There is black exploitation. There is sure. samurai films. There's westerns. There's some Godard if you're into French New Wave. Cool, cool, um, cool. It's, it's not what is. Are you are you saying that it's racist because it shows? I mean, media? I would just I would just like you to go talk to like Marquia or somebody about the uh, black exploitation episode, which is Mushroom Samba. It definitely is. You know portraying black people in a way that is very stereotypical. It is definitely representation. However, it is not inclusion. The other issue that I have with Cowboy Bebop, and I love Cowboy Bebop, don't get me wrong, it is a great series, but what is it about? Okay, what final is... thought, Erica. You can answer her question or use your time however you want. Cowboy Bebop, first of all, I, I think we don't need to have a show that is about anything in particular. There are plenty of shows that don't have like a through line that are incredible. Cowboy Bebop is an ensemble character study. 
Like, you could argue that Firefly is not about anything, or any other Friends is about nothing, or so many other shows that are just about nothing, but the quality of storytelling isn't impacted by that. I think sure. it's Seinfeld that's the show about nothing. Sure, Friends absolutely. about a lot of different things. Friends about a lot of things. Now, here's the thing is, I'm, all, I, I'm in complete agreement. Something doesn't have to be about something in order for it to be a good piece of art. However, in in Galaxy Express 39, you get not only, again, Erica, you bring up the idea of all of these individual episodic standalone episodes. That's exactly what you have in Galaxy Express 39. Each episode is an individual look in Tetsuro's ultimate journey of getting to the point that he realizes that getting a robot body is not all that it is cracked up to be. If you get a machine body, that is sacrificing your humanity. There is a scene where they go to the planet of Pluto and there is, a, and you know, we people are visiting their the bodies. Scene. Anyway, ultimately it is, <laughs> it is about a hero's journey. It is about the journey from being a kid to an adult. And my God, have you seen the eyelashes on the women? In, in Leiji Matsumoto's works, hashtag eyelash goals. Oh, I need some good eyelashes right about now. Max, I'm sure you can agree with me. What are you thinking over there? You get one vote. Joe, you get one as well. Uh, Cowboy Bebop, only because it, as much as Galaxy 39 is, you would say, historically um, a ground changing, groundbreaking anime, Cowboy Bebop is more so for Western audiences. And if we're talking about being an anime geek in America, you gotta give it up for Cowboy Bebop and just how- Based on these arguments. Based on those arguments, mm. Yeah, you don't get to just- <laughs> <laughs> I'm voting for I Max. Appreciate, no, I, I, but, I vote but, for Max. But, but, but the whole thing is, is, you know, the whole, like the dub is also very good. I mean, just technically is very, very well put together. It's one of the, like, just the best produced so you're going with Erica on this one. <laughs> All right, Joe, what are you thinking? Uh, I thought, look, uh, later on in the fight, uh, Emma came out really hard on uh, on themes and sort of the structure of the show and how they supported those. Uh, but even at the beginning of the fight, uh, look, I'm a white male nerd, and so I am genetically encoded to love a really good well, actually. And uh, Emma Five came in <laughs> real hard with uh, <laughs> with, the, with those casting well, actually, at the beginning, so I got to go with Emma. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, what's such a bummer about that is you guys are making me do my job, which is do this tiebreaker right now. I thought really strong points across the table, uh, and it got a little heated, which is what we love here on an anime fight. I think that although um, there were strong points on both sides, like I said, I think that there were just a couple of more that I heard from Emma rebutting Bebop. So Emma, you get this for me. Yeah. Emma, you are the champion of yeah. anime fight. Pocky. I was not. Just sit over here. We'll I was waiting to see how it went. It's, it's in front of you now. Thank I get, you so I much. I will, to you I will enjoy judge. this as we go to the balcony for Roth and Leonard and Jesse Malton and some other special people. That was an awesome anime fight. Thank you so much, Roxy and team. And I am here. I am honored to be here with legendary film critic, Mr. Leonard Malton. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Legend in her own right, Jesse Malton is here. Yes, and you know him, you love him. That's Mr. Greg Miller, Game Over Greggy. And what I want to talk about is people take their movie fights pretty seriously nowadays. And I'm wondering how it's been for you in terms of film criticism, people talking back on Twitter, that interaction. Do you think it's a good thing or we've become sort of polarized? Well, obviously, some of us become polarized, and some people are just looking for a fight. You know, they're, they're raring to go. I'm the opposite. I mean, I don't mind differences of opinion. I got no problem with that. But uh, I don't want to spend my life talking about what I've just opined. You know, I mean, that's my opinion. That's all it is, just an opinion. Take it or leave it. Wise words in the night of movie fights very well. <laughs> Jesse, do you have epic movie fights at home? What are you looking forward to tonight? You're going mano y womano with your dad. Mano y womano. Uh, no, we don't have fights because he knows better. He doesn't, he lives in a house of women. So he just doesn't bother. Because what do you know, it's a happy wife, happy life. Well, he's got happy wife, happy daughter, happy life. Beautiful. That about sums it up. <laughs> Greg, you have been in this space for a long time, so you've been dealing with the fan community. I'm always amazed at how well you interact with your fans. Have you had big trouble around things like Infinity War, or how do you handle all that? 
No, I mean, I think you reap what you sow a lot with an internet community. And kind of funny, we're super lucky that we say, hey, we want to be positive, as I punched Jesse. Uh, we want to be positive. We want that kind of interaction. We want to have a, a positive discourse. And if you don't, that's fine. We're just not the place for you. What are you guys looking forward to most of all tonight? Just doing it. Doing it. Just doing it. We're I, mean, you know, I mean, it's completely unrehearsed, as you know. So anything can happen. Anything can happen, but I have a strong feeling we're going to learn a lot from you. How about you, Greg? I'm looking forward to uh, hugging Leonard Malton. <laughs> Let's make that happen right about now. Remember, you guys can still donate. This entire event, everything, is thanks to you. We owe you such a debt of gratitude. We love this audience. We love this community. We want to thank especially you have donated live right now. Albert, Weird Harma, Ian McAndrew, Sean Patnade, thank you so much for your continued support. You can donate at screenjunkies.com backslash charity event, capital C, capital E. Let's keep on rocking in with a hyper nerd fight. <laughs> All right, thank you, Roth, and I salute Leonard Malton. He is on the Mount Rushmore of film critics. Okay, we've got a super nerdy fun segment right now. We're going to throw down for nerd cred, and we've got some esteemed nerds with us. First, welcome wow. Hector Navarro That's from Hyper Hero. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Oh, uh, right next to him, Jacqueline Coley from Rotten Tomatoes. Hi, my hair is so big. <laughs> it works, it, it works. It. And Dan Casey from the Nerdist. Dan. Thank you for having me, Hal. Hell yeah. All right. Oh, we got a crazy question right now. What character that has not debuted yet should become the anchor of the MCU? Wow, we. All right, Hector, we are going to start with you. All right. Good to go? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. We're going to get Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, and then afterwards, so far, as far as we know, there's no space-centric Marvel Cinematic Universe film. On top of that, Spider-Man Homecoming is killing it. Everybody loves that young energy that Tom Holland brings to the whole world. Everybody loves seeing a teenage character growing up in a world of superheroes. Mm -hmm. Since he's been eight years old, Iron Man's been a thing. So, my pitch is, I brought visual aids, is my dude right here, Nova, specifically Sam Alexander, for very, very specific reasons. Look, that ain't even the right Nova, but I'll allow it. Yeah. I'm not going to, we're not <laughs> Gonna, say that's not we're, the we're not going to diss Richard Ryder, okay? Dick Ryder's a great comic book character, but as you can see, but what I just said, it's going to be tough to pitch him in a movie. So that's why I'm going <laughs> Sam Alexander. On top of that, in the comic book, Sam has this great background. He's from Carefree, Arizona. He's half Mexican, half white. And so he brings this diversity that up to this point, other than Michael Pena, literally no, no Latinx characters in the MCU. And this one would be a part of it and have no t ties to criminality, which would be great for media. Marvel, that would be great. You had your Black Panther. You can't just do a Mexican Black Panther because everybody like you're doing Mexican Black Panther. So you have to do a Mexican American character who can take us back into outer space. He's looking for his long lost father, Jesse Alexander, who was a part of the Supernovas group. Here's the bad guy. Look at this awesome visual aid. Yeah. Titus, this cool, I'm partial to nine foot tall cat creature so this is awesome you get this mixed into it he's a character who in his comic book iteration is visited by Gamora and Rocket Raccoon we'll see what happens with the MCU but he has these ties to it he's bringing this youthful energy he's bringing this perspective we hasn't seen he gets to be the human element kind of like Star-Lord Peter Quill and we don't know what's going to happen after Guardians 3 mm -hmm. that can take us to the MCU we get to experience more space stuff maybe Galactus he's a friend of a watcher which is great we've already seen the watchers in Guardians volume 2 so my pitch is going to be Sam Alexander of the Nova Corps they need more Nova They've been ravished by Ronan. They've been ravished by Thanos now, apparently. So they're going to be recruiting. Sam Alexander's my guy. Thank you for bringing visual aids, Hector Navarro, Jacqueline Coley. I do agree with a lot of the things that Hector said, especially about the fact that we need a space-centric Marvel movie. Unfortunately, I disagree with him because when we look at the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it is a big, wide-sweeping landscape. And I do feel like Nova is just a small corner of that landscape. And I do feel that story is going to be, again, it'll be your neighborhood Spider-Man, but your neighborhood will be far, far away. I think we have that already in the Spider-Man series. I don't think we should veer off it yet. The guy that I think we should go with is a guy that's already been teased, but we haven't yet seen him on screen. And the thing I think is more important to this question is who's going to anchor the Marvel MCU. I think the person for that is Adam Warlock. It was teased at the end of Marvel, sorry, it was teased at the end of Guardians Volume 2. This is what the Sovereign was supposedly creating. He's this being that can't die. We'll be able to bring in the mysticist aspects of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He can control energy. It's planetary. I do feel like this is a character. Do I hate the fact that I'm pitching, you know, quote unquote, another white male to be centered <laughs> on the MCU? Absolutely. But we know with casting, that doesn't necessarily mean that that we, we with the casting ends up. True. The thing I like about him most is the fact that magic is magic when we're talking about it on Earth, and it's 
energy and cosmic mysticism when we're talking about an Asgard. Mm -hmm. And he can kind of bridge that gap between the two. Again, I, I love the idea of, of bringing something young, but Adam Warlock is the guy that can't die. I'm pitching the idea of doing an Adam Warlock movie along the lines of Happy Death Day, where we get to see him die and come back over and over <laughs> again. Because he literally can't die. And then we maybe get to see Lady Death. Sorry, also, I forgot, you know, didn't we hear that, you know, Xandar got blown up? I don't know. Nova is not the one I'm going for, so I'm Ooh. pitching Adam Warlock. All right. Thank you, Jacqueline. Dan. Look, while my friends and colleagues raise excellent points, the future of the MCU is female, specifically Spider-Woman, Jessica Drew. She is someone who has connections to so many things that have already, they've laid the ground stones for in the MCU. She was a Hydra agent for a while, then she became a S.H.I.E.L.D. double agent. She went on to become one of the members of the new Avengers, which seems like a direction we're going to need to go in, considering we're missing uh, quite a few of them after Infinity War. Spoiler alert. Uh, also, she was an agent of sort, which is S.H.I.E.L.D.'s intergalactic arm. That could explain why, perhaps, we haven't seen her in a while. Look, Spider-Man does whatever a spider can, but Spider-Woman goes above and beyond that. She has bioelectric blasts. She is, uh, also, she can, I've traced out her entire arc for this. <laughs> We're gonna have the, no, I'm serious. We have the Skrulls coming in with Captain Marvel. They are going to be the big bads leading into a secret invasion movie. And in the comics, Jessica Drew was replaced by a Skrull named Varenki, and that is going to be the ultimate reveal when they build up this character who grow to know and love, who can grow on to possibly lead the Avengers and then have her turn heel like that. It's going to be the ultimate betrayal. There's a whole arc here. These other characters can play along, but honestly, I don't care about Sam Alexander fighting his inner persona or Jesus Christ Superstar fan fiction come to life. I want to see <laughs> Spider-Woman. Okay. Wow, these three came to play. Mix it up. Uh, listen, Spider-Woman is great. This is about the anchor, and do you really think that we're going to... Agreed, agreed, uh, agreed. Uh, agreed. This is about an anchor for mm -hmm. the MCU that we're going to build. We're essentially saying we're going to have another Iron Man that we're going to then build off of. Yeah. It does not need to be someone who is like deep into that Hydra shield place, which we've already very well explored yeah. through the Captain America We're movies done. and everything else. It's over. Let's get to space. Everybody wants to see more space. That's right. United like, States of space. Guess where Spider Woman's been? <laughs> oh, all over but the galaxy. Not, but here's, it, like Jacqueline's saying, here's the other thing about Spider Woman. She's a great character and I want to see her. But to me, look, Black Widow's going to get her own solo movie in the 80s. But Black Widow so far has been this great presence in the Avengers movies as kind of like a side player. That's where I think she is at her best. The reason that this big reveal when she turned out to be a scroll after years was wasn't the most devastating thing ever is because in the comic books she was that side character she yes. was like a black she widow was like, very, like a very Hill. but yes. she could very, be that anchor but if you do forward. that if you betray the audience that way that's a bad idea Hal that's I think a bad a idea, idea Hal well, well, at least with our characters there's a peel back to where you can at least see a path to it don't, though I don't think that he Nova's an any better anchor in all honesty than, oh, absolutely. than over Adam Warlock. At least with this one, there's a path. It was already teased in Guardians 2. We sure. are pretty there's like so many paths to get to Adam the Nova Warlock. Corps already appeared in, the, in a movie as well. I mean, he supposedly part of his essence is the soul gem. So like there could be a whole part of Avengers Infinity 4 that we can go directly into Adam Warlock. And, doesn't Here's, necessarily mean if that you want to talk happen. about yeah. confusing being yes. a bad thing. Uh -huh. Adam Warlock yes. should be thrown out along with the baby and the bathwater. <laughs> yes, it he is the mo for this for Adam Warlock to even work in any capacity. I feel like James Gunn is going to have to redo the character completely. They it's already... really it, right, and they're already doing that. But it's really tough to argue against what the potentiality of it could be. My character has this great basis, this great foundation solo already from story. the comic books. Agreed. Exactly, he's this, a great in solo the same story. way that Iron Man was a solo story. I just, and so became where do you this, add on? I just can't he picture he Team becomes... Lantern being the anchor of the MCU. Yeah. Going Here's forward. another thing. Unfortunately, I hate to say it, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Marvel Studios is going to beat Warner Brothers before they give us a Green Lantern core movie that we deserve. This is the Marvel version of that similar story. So and later, Nova becomes a member of the Avengers, and then after that, the Champions. He is now a, but you a still staple. Have to introduce a, pillar. a lot of the Marvel Cinematic Universe that we have seen nothing about. That's uh, not true. The Nova Corps has already been introduced they, in Guardians been, One, but the they've part been that messed he up. Plays in and is not the Nova Corps that you're talking about. We're talking about a different be. timeline. It's though. the Supernovas, which is the essentially Nova yeah, the Nova Corps. <laughs> it's essentially hey, you know that thing that we introduced with Glenn Close was in charge of? Well, they're really low on numbers, so we needed some humans. So we got this guy, the father of which I say, you know what? Make Jesse Alexander played by uh, uh, Poe Dameron, everybody's favorite actor in the entire world, Oscar Isaac. And this guy should be played by Anthony Isaac, who voiced uh, the lead character in Coco. Get that Disney money going. <laughs> but these two guys can, can be the foundation, and so many things have already been introduced. Look, uh, all I think I'll say on the last part of it is both of your stories, which I think are great, and I would love to see these movies, I still think they're a solo movie. The thing about Adam Warlock is there's elements of the MCU that we have not seen that his character can really bridge what drops the Time! Wow! Ooh. What a collision! Uh, Dan, talk to us. Anything on the fact side? And um, uh, and then chime in with your judgment. I mean, factually pretty clean, other than the fact that the fighting Galactus would have, had, of course, be contingent on a Fox deal going through. Yeah. Yes. That is a Fantastic <laughs> Four character currently. Uh, really, other than that, just listening to the passion, uh, you know, these guys know more about that than I do. Hell so, yeah. Uh, There's some deep cuts in that fight. Deep cuts. <laughs> yeah. 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 
I, mean, I just don't even know. They could have made it up. I don't know. <laughs> this was a really difficult thing for a while. Uh, Dan was kind of swaying me towards Spider Woman, but ultimately, I think that uh, Jacqueline actually won me over when she mentioned Happy Death Day and the and the idea of how you could do a superhero movie differently and using the Adam Warlock in that way. And uh, that just kind of speaks to my sensibilities. Um, and that was the argument that won me over, so I'm going with Jacqueline. Boom, 1 0 for Jacqueline. Danielle Radford. Um, I have, you know, the the thing that Jacqueline said about Happy Happy Death Day did really get me. Um, Dan did have great arguments. However, unfortunately, what I think he thought was a minus was a plus. The idea of uh, Team Lantern, that is a dope movie, and I want to see it. And it actually helped Hector, um, who also had a lot of really good, very strong casting ideas, um, a really well fleshed out. I feel like this is a movie that Hector has thought about for like three years. Um, <laughs> and so I've got to, I've got to go with Hector. Okay. You know what? For all the reasons that Danielle just said, I also got to go with Hector. Oh, Hector, God. you're welcome, Hector. <laughs> Serious nerd cred for that argument, but Hector has just a little bit more. Yeah, I, didn't think well Adam, I didn't think Adam Warlock could work, and then I heard Jacqueline's pitch, and I was like, shit, that yeah, could work. No. <laughs> no, I want, I want, don't get me wrong, I want these movies. I want to see all, all, all those movies. movies. All these all right. movies. All these all right. movies. <laughs> Thanks for being here, y'all. Yay, so much fun. You know fun. what? Hector takes it. Uh, all the nerd cred. Let's check in with Roth, Spencer, and Joe out there at the party. What up, y'all? Oh, no, my cred. <laughs> <laughs> are killing it, Hal. This is a great night. Thank you guys for sticking with us. Remember, we have puppets coming up later. But first, I want to talk to these two gentlemen right here, Mr. Spencer Gilbert, Mr. Joe Starr. Hi, Rob. At the very start of all of this, one amazing woman made a dream of mine come true. She purchased our top tier reward to choose any honest trailer of her choice, and she went with all of Doctor Who. So I want to check in on how we're doing with that with some fan submitted questions. Perhaps I am the fan. Who is Doctor Who? Oh, Doctor Who is a British wizard um, with a magical girlfriend, right? Yeah. And they travel to... In a box. Uh, yeah. they, they make crank calls in an old phone booth and go on adventures. And yeah. I think they fight like talking vacuum cleaners I'm not as hard, I'm not as far ahead of you. No, they fight a a a, a Donald Dulick. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I would like to know what a TARDIS is and if that's whoa, an offensive whoa, whoa. You word. Can't say that, you cannot <laughs> you cannot say, say that. that on the internet. That is not cool anymore. Absolutely inappropriate. Yeah. Why don't you blink? Oh, uh, well, if you if you blink, then the doctor changes into an, a more charming uh, British, usually a guy, until recently. Laura, I don't want you to worry because we've got this handled. We are going to come in with the smartest, bestest, most wonderful Doctor Who experts to school these gentlemen. And by the end of it, they are going to be riding that TARDIS all the way around the timey-wimey universe. That is a promise from me to you. There are 27 days, 27 days of footage for you guys to watch. What's the plan? Wingardium Leviosa. <laughs> Never seeing our family again. Beautiful. Thank you guys again for tuning on, for, for making this possible at all. We could not have done this without our amazing fans. We could not have done this without you, Laura. And we could not have done this without Jared Quinn, Matt Chapman, and Jonas Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You just contributed live. You can keep contributing at ScreenJunkies.com backslash charity event, capital C, capital E. Do it, do it, do it. Back to you, Sasha. All right, guys, I am sitting here with the next speed round gauntlet fighters. And this is, this is an assassin's row. This is a murderer's row. You know it is. I don't even know where to start. We have some fan favorites. We've got some sprite up and comers. Who here do you feel the most intimidated to fight Matt Key? Because you are a dangerous, dangerous man. Uh, oh. on, on on TV fights maybe, but on movie fights where I'm not prepared at all. Like I'm a, I'm a debater. I'm a what are the questions? Oh, I can sit down and study this. And okay, and a counterpoint point. Like I can do that. Off the cuff movie, I'm gonna lose in the first round. All right. Like I, I'm gonna go down in a blaze of glory. Let me though. Hear that confidence. At least no, it's glorious. I'm confident in how much I'm gonna lose. At least it will be glorious. All right. Well, if we know somebody's gonna lose, that's just the way of the game. But you know who almost never loses is superhero. So iffy. If there was a superhero who was fighting a movie fight, who would win and who would they take down? Oh man, I think uh, you know I'm, I'm gonna say 
it's a superhero. Sorry, I, I opened up the whole whole box. I'd say I think it'd be like you know Tony Stark because he has the brains, but he also has the charisma. It takes a lot of charisma. You got to use that charisma sometimes. <laughs> Have I said charisma enough? I don't know. <laughs> you got to use that charisma. See, this is like a test fight. This is a practice yeah. fight. Okay, Koi, you are also incredible at specifically the speed round what makes you good how do you think you're gonna have the key to victory to take down all these other fools well i like to hold the mic crazily which really <laughs> helps the formatting and also i always train with some tech nine some m&m some yellow wolf some machine gun kelly on the way so i wrap along to get my vocal cords ready and then i also like to structure everything in a three-act structure so my arguments are sound whilst being speedy and it's the only place i can talk fast and actually get to use it so Incredible. Ready with it. I feel like already. I always slow down in the world, but not here. Amy, I saw a look on your face. Uh, was that fear? Was that uh, was that you just getting game ready? How are you feeling right now? It's, it's a mixture of awe and uh, being like, I'm taking notes. I didn't recognize any of the names of those bands, but I can <laughs> like well, the fast talking. Oh, shit. <laughs> bands named Machine Gun Kelly for 500, Alex. Uh, but the fast talking, I can do that. So hopefully I can rise to whatever, this challenge. Whatever it is they're going to ask us. Is there any question that you do not want? When you're already making faces. Anything about the Oscars, because my brain does not have the memory to contain all that. Mm. All right. Yeah. Well, we are going to throw this over now. Speaking of people who have a ton of knowledge contained in their big brains, we're about to see a family torn asunder, but it's all for a great cause. And keep in mind, you guys can keep donating. Please, please, please. Women in Film is such an incredible organization. Give them your money. Come on. But before you give them their money, watch this fight with the classiest lady in the house. It's Alicia Malone with a classic movie fight. Marquis, Mar McCarty's awesome. <laughs> Hello there. Hello. Well, if you build it, we will come. Welcome to a very special round of classic film fights. I'm Alicia Malone, and I want to say thank you to everyone for all your donations, your contributions. We've all been blown away by how much you've supported women in film, and it's so important. So thank you so much. And we have a pretty bumpy night ahead of us, so you might want to put on your seatbelts because we are battling father and daughter. So we have, you know, it's the pictures that got the uh, small, he's still big, Let's see, you know what I mean. Uh, he's, he's so big actually that he has his own day here in Los Angeles. It is the esteemed film critic, Mr. Leonard Moulton. Thank you, thank you. And she is ready for her close up, Mr. DeMille. She's the co-host on Moulton on Movies, Jesse Moulton. Yeah. And uh, because I always depend on the kindness of strangers, over there we have Mr. Dan Murrell doing facts and checking and judging and stuff. And right next to him, Roth Cornette is stepping in as another judge. How you doing? It's going to be the easiest fact check ever. <laughs> <laughs> kidding me? Yeah, we have the encyclopedia. Yeah, don't, 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 I literally don't, don't turn to Leonard to check the facts, exactly. so it's fine. Exactly. Well, we have a great question. The question today is, who is the greatest femme fatale? Ooh. Ooh, how are you guys feeling about the fight? Are you ready? Well, here's the thing. We fight at home all the time. Yeah. Like, that's, that's no fun. Why, why would I want to fight with, why would I want to embarrass him? Here, in front of all of these lovely Mighty people. Yeah. Don't yes, you why? think? Yes, why? Yeah. I think that maybe you should battle my dad. Whoa! <laughs> I can't battle oh, Mr. Leonard Moulton. I definitely think sure you right? can. Come on, you guys, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sure you can. Yeah. 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 My fighting days were over. I, I retired from fighting. I know. No. I know. <laughs> But think of the children. <laughs> think of the, women. You know? the tiny and tots. If not now, yes. Yes, the tiny tots at home, Alicia. You have to. All right. What do you think? Look at this precious face. Yes. Take, yes. take yes. this yes. precious yes. face down, yes. Alicia. Okay. All right. I'll give it a go. Yes. yes. And it's, can, can you come? Yes. Host. Right. Need, Honor. need a host for this, and I'll move over. I'm oh, not gosh. saying I'm not saying you should be intimidated, Daddy. I would never say that. No. But um, I it, is, it is a women in film day. Yes, yes, it, is. So, yes it is. I oh, would do tough. anything to see the return of the Red oh, Fury. Here we go in black and white, live rusty. in color. <laughs> Let's hear your answer, Leonard. Best femme fatale of all time. Barbara Stanwyck as Felix Diedrichsen in Double Indemnity. Ooh, very oh. tough to beat, Alicia. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with a film that I just saw recently again, uh, Leave It to Heaven. 
Ellen Barrent, played by Jane Tierney. Oh, this is going to be a good one. Ingloria, Inglorious Technicolor. Technicolor, <laughs> yeah. yeah. These are very interesting and wonderful choices. Leonard, let's hear from you first. Well, of course, uh, uh, Stanwyck is a great actress, and she could do anything. She could do high drama, she could do comedy, and everything in between. But here, she's playing a part, she's playing a character who is literally a femme fatale, because death is involved, murder is involved in this story. And who wrote it? Raymond Chandler and Billy Wilder. You know, you don't get a better pedigree than that. Apparently they hated each other and didn't get along at all, the two men, the two writers. And Wilder also directed. But the results, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. They turned out a, a terrific script, a terrific movie. And it's only Wilder's, I think, third or so directorial endeavor. Uh, but the minute he sets her up, the minute you see her, he, it's a great reveal when she comes down the steps of the winding steps of her home and uh, Fred McMurray is he can't keep he can't po poker face doesn't work here he is smitten clearly though he's there on an insurance case and he's supposed to be professional that goes out the window pretty quickly and she is not I, I wouldn't call it a subtle role or a subtle performance but she's not campy she's not over the top and she and Fred McMurray parry throughout the film. There's one dialogue scene, anybody who's seen the movie will remember it, where it's just snap, crack, pop, pop dialogue, just unbeatable. And she's wearing a blonde wig, which is very odd, <laughs> but works. Everything works in this film. That is a compelling, very tough to beat case <laughs> for one of the most iconic characters of all time, Alicia. Does, yeah. does it help if I do this? Yeah, <laughs> that's that away a little bit of the I'm going to look away okay. from my childhood okay. hero right now. Um, so, Leave It to Heaven, as you mentioned, Leonard, it's a Technicolor film noir. And it's so unnerving and quite surreal and dreamlike to see all these dark happenings, these murders happen in broad daylight and beautiful color. And I feel like that also mirrors the character of Ellen because she is gorgeous. She's very glossy. She comes from, you know, middle class family and uh, but she's a fatal woman. She's very dangerous and she kills anyone who gets in her way. And the thing that I find compelling about her is that she as it says in the film, it's she loves too much. So she's not motivated by money or power, it's by love. And uh, I mean, she is so fascinating as a character because she falls in love with Richard because he reminds her of her father, <laughs> very daddy issues there. You could so much to delve into psychologically. And then she will kill anyone, no matter how sweet or innocent or helpless they are, if they threaten to divert Richard's attention away from her. So I think so often in movies, women are allowed to be only shy shades of extreme. They're, they're good or they're evil, they're very stereotypical, but here you have so much going on simultaneously. You see underneath, thanks to Jean Tierney's understated performance, that she is ruthless, but she also has a sense of vulnerability underneath. You see in her big eyes that go glassy with tears. So there's a weird way that you feel for her at the same time that you're terrified of her. Leave it to Alicia Malone to come out swinging <laughs> for what seemed like an unbeatable Fight! Oh, I, yeah. oh, I am torn. I'm now one quick follow up for you both. How do you think each of your characters, and Leonard, I, you'll clearly be able to speak to this, has impacted cinema in terms of how we both mm -hmm. perceive and depict women? Well, Double Indemnity came at the very beginning of what we now call the film noir genre. It wasn't called that then. They were called hard boiled melodramas, there were other kind of names they had for what later, you know, became film noir. So she's pretty early in the game. I mean, maybe Mary Astor in The Maltese Falcon precedes her, and a couple of others perhaps. But she's been imitated, ripped off, and usually with only moderate, if any, success. Because Stanwyck just gives it 100%. She's playing this woman for all it's worth. And with this silly blonde wig, which which just sort of calls more attention to her, in a way, in a, in a funny kind of a way. So I think being a an exemplar of femme fatale, femme fatalism, <laughs> uh, means that you're going to be copied, and uh, uh, you know copies are never as good as the original.
Mm. All right, Alicia. Well, I think it's it's still so shocking to see Jean Tierney in this role. I mean, she is a woman who watches her husband's disabled brother drown oh, and doesn't do anything to save what him. What a scene. Such a scene, and she just chillingly watches him until she realizes her husband is there, and then she puts on the ruse of going to fight for him. But I think in terms of it being a complex character, a character that is is still quite shocking for women to watch. There's one moment when she says uh, she's pregnant and she says she something like she feels like she's a prisoner. This beast, I think she calls her baby, uh, has imprisoned her body and that's something that sometimes women, you know, my friends have been gone through pregnancies that they are terribly sick and they're really excited for their baby but they also feel like they are a prisoner of their own body and it's something that you know often see in films or talk about in films. So she's just a very complex woman and I think you you fear for her, you also fear of her and I think just as as an example of an interesting female character and especially uh, a character that's not just evil on one level, she has so many layers going on to her. These are two And she, uh, she also sleeps in full makeup. Uh, you know what? Oh, well, what? But everybody did that. Yeah, yeah. And swims yeah. in lipstick. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think some people still do that today, Alan. Yeah. These are two beautiful films. If you guys haven't seen mm -hmm. them, those are your pitches to go see them immediately. Yeah. They are gorgeous, gorgeous portraits of two very different women. Both great cases. I need help, Jesse. It's tough. It's it's hard. See, this is the the trickiest thing about the classic movie fights. Is that these films are classic for a reason. <laughs> And uh, for us talking to Alicia about classic film, the love is there and it is a Sophie's Choice situation. Choose your favorite anything. You go, how? How can you choose one? These, these have lived for such a long time because of the impact they have and continue to have when you watch them again. Uh, we were all just at the TCM Film Festival and you're sitting in a theater with people and you're watching it as if it's new. Mm -hmm. And it affects people just like it did the first time. Uh, so I don't know. That is, that is, part of my heart wants to go with my dad. <laughs> part of my head wants to go with Alicia. <laughs> oh, the head and the heart. <laughs> Just, who are you going to pick? I have to go with my dad. All Fair right. Dad. There you go. I understand. Dan, the weight is on you. Let's hear the facts. Oh, Let's hear your story. Such a weight. Both, two great performances, two both Oscar-nominated performances. Uh, Double Indemnity was Billy Wilder's third English-language film. Mm -hmm. uh, his fourth overall, he did a French film called Bad Seed, translated Bad Seed. So Mauvaise Grain. There you go. See, this is why I don't have to fact check. <laughs> I know. I should have just asked anyone. You've got anyway. the movie guy yeah, right there here. There you go. Uh, this was very difficult, and... I, you know, it, it's it's kind of like Jesse said. There's a reason that these uh, performances have endured for so long because they're both great and memorable and mm -hmm. and part of film history. Uh, the argument that got to me though, and then and then when it was kind of put in the scale, this is kind of how I, I kind of framed everything else, which is that Alicia made a great argument for her choice, which was a great femme fatale, but you know, kind of what Leonard said, why imitate the best when you can be the best? And I think he made such a great argument for Barbara Stanwyck. The fatale was involved, uh, you know, and I, I have to go with Leonard on this one. All with right. Double Doesn't Dan okay. look like an adorable Forrest Gump in this house? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody tweeted me and asked who let me walk out of the house looking like this, you and my mom said great. I looked great. So. I think you look like a handsome great. devil. I think you look exactly you like look a really handsome great, devil. So. I have to say that's uh, going to be one of my favorite fights of this event, I am sure. My heart, I I honor and I respect and adore and worship you, Leonard, but my heart actually went with the Red Fury on this one, with Alicia. I thought she hey. made a great case for a she very did. complicated yeah. character, but it doesn't matter what I think. The two <laughs> votes went to Leonard. Leonard takes Yay. it. Uh, thank you. I just want to thank say you. to Leonard and Jesse, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for our your support, and Alicia, um, it, it means the world, and we are honored to have all three of you Can here Can I just us. add one quick thing? Yes. And Savage and Detour. Lana Turner and the Postman Always Rings Twice, <laughs> Peggy Cummins and Gun Crazy, Rhonda Fleming and Out of the Past, Joan Bennett and Scarlet Street. That's all I want to say. I love that you said all of those things. And after those incredible words of wisdom, we're going to hear from Nick Mundy. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome back, Raw Dogs. Hit it, Raw Dog. Oh, no. Still? Yeah. Oh, God. Raw Dog's back. Well, guys, we're going to, we're talking women in film. 
Uh, well, I want to start it off with uh, a, a director who has a film in theaters currently, Lynn Ramsey. She, oh, she's great. great. You were never Did someone really... say someone was talking about women in film? Oh, oh crap. Okay. It's the internet. Oh. Yeah, that's right. It's me, the personification of the internet, just to catch people up who have no idea what this show is as to what this bit is. Well, that's mostly everybody. What's your problem with women in film? I have a very well thought out critique. And that is? What about, wait for it, Men in film! Uh, internet, don't you realize that there are a lot of men in film and we're not like pushing them out? We just want to celebrate the women in film? Really? Yeah, it's a predominantly male industry. Oh. So Look at us. We got the show just from showing up. That's Literally. true. This, uh, this is a predominantly male variety act. Yeah, so... I don't know, man. Did, is that all you got? I, I, it's, just, it's nice to see you. I've been really lonely the last two years. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I got really excited when I heard you were coming back so that I could hate you more! Yeah. That also makes sense. Did, did you like The Last Jedi? Oh, I did. Uh, and that's why I love what we're doing right now, because it's just a collection of weird lore that no one really cares about, all jammed and put into your face, and you didn't ask for it. I'm with the internet on this one, actually. Yeah, we rarely agree, but I'm, I'm, I, I agree with the internet. All right, well, we're gonna... We've just got a lot to do today, so I'm just, thanks for having me on the show again. Oh, yeah. Bye, the internet. Hey, good to see you. Bye. Go back to writing honest trailers. Take me with you. Monday Night Raw! Monday Night Raw on a Thursday what? for one night only. That's how we do it here at Screen Junkies. And I'm here with your TV fighters coming up next. You guys, we've been talking a lot about women in film. I want to know, who is the best woman on TV? Yell? Uh, Mariska Hargitay from SVU, obviously. <laughs> That is obvious answer. She doesn't even have to fight it. That's nope, just the no, answer. No, no, no. You're welcome. Stacy, what you got? Oh, gosh. I mean, I have to go with, like, Olivia Here. Pope <laughs> from Scandal? Go. Yeah. We're going to go with Olivia Pope. We're going to go with strong women in suits. Got to have a mm. nice suit, a crisp suit. Oh, always. see, she actually threw in a fact. Yeah. Michelle? I'm taking Tandy Newton in Westworld. Oh. oh. Woman in suit Beautiful. and also rocking a Westworld madam outfit. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay with both. Uh, now we have our drunk movie fights. <laughs> Champion. I'm sober right now. Ken Knapsack. Yeah, what's up, Sasha? <laughs> it's nice to have you here, dude. How do you feel about going into this fight? Who do you think is going to be a competitor? How have you felt about this evening in general? I've uh, I've known Stacy for a very long time. She is, as her nickname sometimes is, Sassy Stacy Howard. Um, Yell is a fighter. May have murdered three people at some point during Maybe. a movie fight there or TV fight. There might be a body in the parking lot. But I've been sure. working with Boyd for a long time, and she has studied the queen herself, Cersei Lannister. Uh, I trust she'll find a way to win. Uh, it's, these, this is a tough, tough fight. I have to say, though, we're coming up on the speed round gauntlet. And the speed round is a killer. What is the key to winning a speed round? Talk oh, first. No, <laughs> talking first. Yes, but, but speaking and not stopping. That's what it is. Because something will come out of your mouth and it will be a sentence and it will make sense at some point. Just like I'm doing now. I have not thought about it, but I'm saying words. There you go, you're at it. Ding! <laughs> Ding! Well, before we get into the fight, if the good people want to find you, if the good people want to shout out, because your answers are wrong, where can they find you guys? Uh, I'm everywhere at Yell Teagle. I am at Stacy O. Howard. No E, no I, just Y. I don't know if I looked at the right camera. <laughs> <laughs> I ruined it. I ruined She's it. a professional. It's fine. And I'm at Michelle Boyd, M-I-C-H-E-L-E-B-O-Y-D. And you guys, remember, you can keep donating to this incredible cause. You can support these women. Tweet at us. Get into the Women in Film charity, and of course, just keep being part of this event, which we're all so excited to be doing. We're so proud of, and e equally proud. I've got Roxy Stryer yes. sitting on the desk, ready to throw down another gauntlet. Yeah. Go, Roxy! <laughs> My girl Sasha getting me so excited for this speed round gauntlet. You guys know that we're, we're on right now. We're live, too, so get with it here. And I was about to make a joke, too. What, did I ruin it? Hold on, hold on, hold on. I was going to say, here. you know how again. these gauntlets work when you Do snap? Oh, wait, that's the wrong gauntlet. I even got it written for me oh, by Lon. It, oh, it got man. ruined. You guys butchered it. Let's get into this, though. You guys Matt know. Keegan joke butcher. That's what I, that's what I do. <laughs>
Man, how do microphones you, man, you blew it. You blew it so hard. You guys have 20 seconds each to fight something and okay. 10 seconds to rebut. You've done this before. Yeah. Been here, done this. If you want away with us today. Hey, how's it going, everybody? It's your boy. Just hold it down. <laughs> <laughs> that was seriously, <laughs> seriously big muscles. Yeah. I cannot Legit do gonna that. just leave right now. <laughs> Not even gonna lie. And Matt Key, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> if there's a movie fight, there's a map! That's fine. You didn't even want to throw them up. You didn't want to... <laughs> All right, cool. Like, compared to this, like... <laughs> so let's get Hey, into Alfred it. A. Newman, show off your muscles next to Superman! <laughs> We've got oh. some amazing people coming up after you guys. I doubt either of you makes it to the end, but maybe you'll prove me oh, wrong. Oh, okay. Here we go. Oh, definitely will not. I was mad that they messed up my joke. I'm, I'm, little, we, I'm a little we bitter earned, We it. earned your ire. You're yeah, right. Yeah, you guys okay. are so right. All right, it's let's okay. go into it. I actually don't even know where my speed round questions are. They're supposed to be on cards somewhere, I heard, that they're going to be popping up somewhere to... with the first speed round question as they come up on the cards from what I was told. Oh, oh, I have it. Oh, Billy did it. And they actually <laughs> paper. Okay, yep, here we go. Gosh. With the first speed round from a donator. Thank you so much, JC Jones. Here is the question. What is the best Kurt Russell movie of all time? Oh. A lot of oohs and ahs from the audience. I escaped from L.A. <laughs> uh, uh, big Trouble in Little China. Okay, Effie, starting with you. Look, man, Escape from L.A. is that 90s movie because it has everything you want. You know, a dude in an eye patch, long hair, leather, jacked up, and ready to get jacked up. Also, <laughs> surprisingly progressive for its time. It had a, uh, a trans character. It was they never made fun of her of her pronouns or anything. They actually addressed her as a superior. Uh, I said Big Trouble in Little China, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Good Big Trouble in Little China. Uh, he's a truck driver. This is this is Kurt Russell at his best. He's grizzled. He's hairy. He's wearing a, t a tank top the whole time just to show off them Kurt Russell muscles. The Russells from Muscles. That's what or the Muscles from Russell. I think is is his nickname. I don't know. Uh, go with it. Uh, and he's fighting ninjas. And uh, they're they're in they're in Little China. And it's amazing. That's tight, but he had no leather pants in Big Trouble in Leather China, and he 100% did in Escape from L.A., and those pants were shiny, and he was even getting wet at the beginning. He was underwater. You got wetness. <laughs> Uh, well, he had leather pants, which is great. He was wearing a tank top, and he did drive a semi. And Kurt Russell in a semi with the the CB, like, no, 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 no. This is uh, Kurt Russell, and I'm a, I'm a badass. This is fucking cool. Uh, come on. Oh gosh, I feel like we spent a lot of time talking about leather in this last one and being wet, which made me uncomfortable. Uh, I think though, what I heard more about was not just Kurt Russell in the movie, like which is the best Kurt Russell, but which is the best Kurt Russell movie. And that was from you, Iffy. Oh, Iffy, you, you get so the much. point on this one and therefore you will be staying through to this next round, which will so, be against Wendy Lee Zaney. Yeah. And, so and Matt, can, that's your cue to- So I can go get some cheese? That's your cue cool. to get the cheese. Yeah. Get out of Wendy's way. <laughs> And cut right and cross that camera. So yeah, like killing it, yeah, killing it, team. <laughs> All right, Wendy, here we go with this next round. If you ready, Wendy, yeah. you ready? I'm not ready, but I am at the same time. Here we go. I'm just gonna keep talking. That's the advice I got before I got here. Just Don't keep know talking. what to do with that one, so I'm just gonna keep on barreling through. This one is from the donator Doron T Rose. Thank you so much. Other than Gollum. Who is the best evil character in the Lord of the Rings films? Other than Gollum. Gonna call that Eye of Sauron. I'm going to, oof. I am going to say, I can't remember his name, but it's the steward. We can, we can accept do we, it. Do we, we'll, okay. We'll work with that. Huh? We'll work with that. All right. Is that a yes from the team? Yes. Ooh, okay, great. Stuart, if he's starting right. with In you. Return of the King, to be specific. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so have you ever been taking a dump in a public restroom and then you're looking through the slit and you're like, is somebody staring at me? And it freaks you out. That's what the Eye of Siren is. Just through the whole movie, he's just he's just peeping. You're like, it feels like somebody's watching me. And someone is. It's the Eye of Siren. Also, it's on fire, too. So you, you're sitting there. Not only are you afraid, but you're wondering, does he need an eye drop or something? Because maybe that would make him less evil. So Denethor is just mentally unstable, killing one of his own family members because that's what he thought was right no matter what it is he he is just 
stopped believing in anything that is relevant and all he saw was was what he wanted and the right idea and never ever ever I mean, this is Middle Earth. Lots of people are killing people, killing family members. You know what people aren't doing? Peeking, sneaking, looking at other people, and that's creepy because that's even <laughs> even the orcs are not doing that. You know who's doing it? Aya Sauron. Very weird. Aya Sauron doesn't do anything. He stands on the top of a tower and just moves this big creeper mm -hmm. red eye thing around and does nothing. Denethor physically put a family member still alive on a pile of wood to burn to death. That is pure evil. Whoa. Whoa. I'm hearing some Sasha woo woo woos. <laughs> Is that a woo woo? Damn, uh, that that comeback was really strong, but what I will say is that the question is best evil character, not most evil character. And while I do feel like, Wendy, you describe more evil things, Ify, I think you describe the best evil character. Yeah, so Ify, you're getting this one too. You're staying at the table. Wendy, great job. Markia McCarthy coming up next. Coming in hot now, yo. This chair. I think I want that chair. <laughs> that might be the win. Ify, is that chair getting pretty warm? Uh, you want to swap? Yeah, you want to feel a little warm there? Yeah, yeah. I was really gonna do it do because we do of the it whole for the microphone luck? thing. Oh, okay. We're really swapping chairs. I was doing a little bit, but now it's actually. <laughs> Billy's yeah. like, Billy's like, oh, we do that, not have time for chair swapping. <laughs> Get on with it. So here we go, uh, guys. This question is coming from Krista Rister. We love you, Krista. Ooh. She says, if you are planning a party where you and your friends are going to marathon an entire film franchise, which she's qualifying as something that is at least eight hours long, what would be the best marathon? Marvel Cinematic Universe. The host of Marvel Movie News fighting that shocker. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> In a good way. All right, five. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go uh, the Halloween franchise. Okay. Marquia, whenever you are ready. Okay, because my party's gonna be a bachelorette week, and that's gonna start with all the thirst traps that you get in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We're gonna start off with Iron Man, obviously, because 2008, and we're gonna bring that back. We're gonna start it off 2008 themed with Iron Man and work our way progressively through changing our outfits as we're drinking, working through Iron Man. We have Thor, we're gonna do Thor Dark World. We're gonna do that one on weed though, uh, because it's gonna we're gonna keep that high and uh, we're gonna hit Thor Ragnarok. All that thirst powering through, and then I will have Infinity War for my girls, because we're going to complete that book and all of our thirst in, in, in between and action all the way through. Do I say have more time? Uh, along with that. <laughs> <laughs> and Ryan's one job. Okay, iffy. <laughs> uh, so, so my party is actually going to be a spooky dookie party where everybody dress up like the Baba Duke and we watch Halloween. Uh, and so, like, for that movie, you know, we, we, we want to get in, but really what we're making our way to is Halloween H2O because I got my man Buster Rhymes in it. I love the MCU, but it's missing something. Bus a bus. And uh, where are we going to get it? Halloween H2O. If Bus a bus was in the movie, if Bus a bus was in the MCU, it would probably be a complete franchise, like the Halloween franchise. Something amazing about the MCU and having that as a party is that it's actually going to make sense as it goes through, as opposed to Halloween when you have to keep on going back, keep on going back, and they killed Jamie Lee Curtis, and I'm not about that, and that is not a party, that is a funeral. What? No, no, you're... You're actually wrong about this. Halloween makes sense because it's the same antagonist throughout all the movies. Marvel, MCU, people are going to be like, why does Dark World suck? Why does, you know, like, people are going to be following it, and there's like, oh, man, Doctor Strange is droopy. Whoa. <laughs> you just called Doctor wow. Strange droopy. he's droopy. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of fighting words in this one. Um, I, first of all, I want to let you guys know that I learned what a thirst trap was this week, so I'm really happy I learned that before this <laughs> argument. Thank you so much. I'm... I'm really feeling the age here. Uh, second of all, I think that while there was a little shade thrown at the MCU saying that some of the movies like Dark World, maybe people wouldn't like, they definitely would make sense in this marathon. I think the argument for it, you just painted a fun party. And that's what this was about. You painted a great marathon. So it is this seat, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Marquia, you get this oh, one. Yeah, Ify, you fought yeah. strong, you fought yeah. hard, but just not enough. Amy Dallin up next, guys, coming in. Are we gonna do another seat change, or are we feeling good now? Just if, kidding, if we don't micro, have time for that. If that microphone goes back down, I'll gladly sit there. No, it, it I just own it. It's gotta stay up there. Here we go. This next question from Charles Lay. Thank you, Charles. Which movie is more fun to rewatch, Tron or Tron Legacy? Woo! Tron. 
Uh, Tron Legacy. <laughs> that yeah. would be the only other answer. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. Marquia, whenever you're ready. Enough cannot be said about how incredibly fun it is to do a revisit back to Tron because that you can also like theme that around your day kind of a thing. Like you can do like an ultimate Frisbee thing like during the day portion because Tron would be at night. Uh, and then along with that, uh, you can, you have that styled out wear. And uh, really awesome about Tron is that there is enough practical effect balance next to CGI as opposed to Tron. Okay, so this question isn't about which movie's gonna be more likely to be remembered or which movie's considered more of a classic. It's about which one is more fun to rewatch. And Tron Legacy is a big Technicolor party, uh, which is really fun to revisit. Amazing soundtrack. You could, I was listening to your party question, you could theme it and be like, today is the cycle combat day, today is the nightclub day, today is the. What's really great about the rewatch with Tron is that particular like uh, car driving one where you're like, wah, 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 and then they like do that with the smash thing and then Tron Legacy, they kind of missed the mark on that. And that, that really, really frustrated me as a viewer. So I wouldn't want to rewatch that. Okay, but you could show off the tricks that are unique to Tron Legacy. The use of 3D comparable to Wizard of Oz where they're using all of the tricks at their disposal. You can find new things in it. And it's just sort of a good time movie as opposed to an all time classic. Oh gosh, this uh, amazing question. First of all, Charles has really put our fighters to the test here. <laughs> so great job, both of you guys. I have to say, based off of these arguments, I'm not 1,000% convinced that Amy has seen either. Maybe, maybe you have. Maybe you have. Marquia gave specifics, and yours was more general. Marquia, you get the point on this one. Amy, you fought your best, though. Amy, you are moving out of that seat that is getting colder and colder. Lon Harris coming in to see if he can heat it up. All right. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Why, why are we squealing? That's what? my. That's a, for apparently the noise that I make when movie fighting. All right. I make a squeaky, a high pitched squeak. Oh, so like if like he was it. a squeaky toy? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I go Titanic. Like that. So let's move on from that because mm, I'm about ready. Thank you. David Morris, thank you. David wants to know which film character would you want to fight for you in a dance off battle? Star Lord. Oh. A lot of ooze, ooze. Uh, I'll go Nomi Malone from Showgirls. I've never actually heard Sasha so excited about anything <laughs> in her entire life. Malone should be here. Uh, uh, that, well, so she's not, okay, but Marquia <laughs> is. Marquia, we're starting with you. Okay, the reason I chose Peter Quill because not only is he an ultimate dance-off champion, he his dance-off skills are so strong that he was able to distract Ronan the Accuser from smashing the Power Stone into the surface of Xandar when he was one step away from winning. Peter Quill's dance moves and that dance-off just brought that. And I'm sorry, Noe Malone doesn't have those dance skills because uh, it's definitely not. You can already tell. Starlord is intentionally a comic dancer. He's doing it to distract. He's doing it to be silly. Nomi Malone is 100% invested in that performance. It's not, it's not ironic. It's not cute. She's giving her 100%. It may look strange to those of us who are not Vegas showgirls ourselves, but that is 100% her and her performance and her truth coming out through dance. And that's who I want defending me. Woo. Uh, it's proven cinematically that Peter Quill was not dancing ironically. He was dancing for the fate of Xandar and then the fate of other planets that were in there while Naomi was dancing for the fate of her next line of coke. Uh, and <laughs> well, That's horrible it's insult to true. Naomi Malone. She has a little drug problem. I don't know if we hold that against her in terms of representing me in the dance off. And Peter Quill's being silly. He's being funny. It's a distraction move. It's not who's the greatest dancer. He's not Black Swan. He's trying to distract Ronan. Oh. <sighs> I don't know if I'm getting just swayed by the cheers and boos of the audience, but I will say that the invested part of it did get to me more, and the end line not being a better dancer, it's not the point. It's who is really going to give it their all. And are we sure that Star-Lord's going to be invested in fighting for you? We don't know. Lon, you're taking this one. That yeah. seat finally has yeah. one. Team the seat. Marquee, a great job. All all way. Way. No. I was going to say Star-Lord. Yeah, yeah. Star -Lord. <laughs> I don't know how that just happened. I really don't know. The fight Final fight though will be between between Lon and Koi Jandro coming up to the table. Yeah. Oh, my asleep. Oh, no. oh, all right. Okay. So you should not be the person we elect to do the dance off for no, us. Yeah. Is what you were trying to say. I don't even give you guys a second to sit because we're getting right into this with Sam Purcell. Thank you, Sam. The question is, what is the best sequel 
that changed genres slash tone from the movie before Aliens. It. Oh, uh, Gremlins 2, new batch. Koi, whenever you are ready. Alien was a fantastic horror film, but Aliens made an action genre that is new and complete to itself. It was a sci-fi action movie. It showed us what James Cameron could do. It showed us what the genre could become, and it allowed the movie to turn into an entirely new genre while building on the uh, pre-established notions of the film. It didn't negate the, uh, the, the criteria. It didn't negate any of the rules, but it built upon it, and it allowed us to be bigger and more. And that's what a sequel's supposed to do, but in that new genre, it was able to bigger and more and add more Aliens while not sacrificing the first one's integrity. It... <laughs> The original Gremlins is a great sort of horror with a little bit of like a comical sort of satirical tone. It's really very dark in its sensibility. But what the genius of Gremlins 2 is it takes the same concept and the same world and the same characters and it turns it into this absurdist cartoon over the top sort of hyper reality that's really one of the only films in its sort of respective genre. It's this really heightened, larger than life, really absurd comedy. Alien 2 gave us you bitch. Gremlins 2 gave us lots of little funny hijinks. Gremlins 2 isn't that rememberable. It's remembered for being a comedy. It's light. It's fluffy. Aliens 2 is what gave us James Cameron's Alien 2. That's such a different movie. And it didn't negate. Gremlins 2 negated the first one. A Alien and Aliens are really not very different in terms of the genre. There's more action in the second. There's more aliens. But really, it's still, it's a sci-fi movie. It's a horror movie. We're really in the same world. They're functionally very similar. Plot-wise, they're extremely similar. Ah! Uh that's the noise that I make. Uh, <laughs> it's more like, <laughs> it's more like that. No, there. no, that's the Roxy Stryer noise. Oh, ah. oh gosh, this was such a good one. Interesting point at the end there, Lon, about whether it is or is not in a different genre, but I feel like Koi did a great job fighting that it was, even though he couldn't come back at that. I think that his fight was just stronger. Koi got in more words, which is one of your tactics. <laughs> that is Koi, a tactic. you get the point, and there's oh, no, more the victor. Oh, no. <laughs> Didn't Love need that. to breathe. Breathing is overrated, Sasha. Gosh, jeez. Oh, we're gonna throw this now. Congratulations to Koi to the balcony as they are hanging out, and we're gonna uh, come back here with some long-awaited TV fights. <laughs> What's up, party people? Hope you're having fun out there. Uh, one big part of your generous donations means that you have unlocked the belt. That's right, we're bringing back the belt. But it has at this point been vacated, so let me break down who is going to win and how. The belt is on the line today, but we don't know which fight it's going to be. Who's going to be the champ? We're going to have a new one coming out of today's fight. Who will be challenging them is one of these gentlemen, plus Koi, I believe, who just yeah. won that. All right, Koi will be coming out in a second. So the winner, the winner of the speed gauntlet, Ed. Uh, wait, Mundy, what are you doing here? <laughs> Just having a cold one, okay. To be fair, uh, Nick is not in contention. Nick is not in contention for the belt. Fair enough. So uh, one, of, one of these gentlemen, uh, Ed, Joe, or Coy, will be joining Dan and I as the only people lucky enough to have touched this magical object. Uh, it will be determined in the coming weeks. Uh, Ed, do you have any words for your uh, competitors? Uh, just get ready for these uh, 17 and a half inch pythons to come down on you. <laughs> good, All good. Right, Joe? I'm just excited that we could have a, a real puppet as a champion instead of our two previous puppet champions. Whoa. <laughs> Dan, how does it feel to be uh, bitter like me that we don't have this anymore? Uh, I mean, I've, I've had months to live with it now, so it's just a part of me. <laughs> the sadness has become a part of him. Yeah. <laughs> That's all from here. I'd like to thank some uh, donors who've come in during the show. Billy Pollahan, what's up, man? Thank you so much. Grace Nixon, thank you so much. Cody Hoyt. You're doing it, guys. You're doing it. And uh, you know who else is doing it? Roxy for an upcoming TV Fights. Back to you, Roxy. Hack the planet! <laughs> and you're on, Roxy. We can share. Oh! Holy hey! hey! crap! Oh, man! And that really does feel like the start of a TV <laughs> Fights <laughs> podcast. Yes! yes! Uh, Nothing better than us being delayed like that. <laughs> Holy crap, has it been a minute since we've been here. And if you were wondering if Lucille has changed, Looks the same to me. No, they threw away my old bat. It was a, it was a big issue, it's fine. But let's come back with some of our most amazing fighters, the people who have earned their spot at this table for the TV Fights mm -hmm. comeback. And might I mention, it is all women in film Woo! at the yes! table. Yeah! Starting to my left, it is Yael Teagle in the house. Hello, hello. Hey, hey, hey. I'm a princess, hello. Very <laughs> elegant of you. Yeah, yes? I'm ready to throw down, so I thought I'd start off polite. Okay, okay, Stacey Howard. Hey, I'm not elegant at all. What's up, guys? I'm just gonna start off like this. 
Hey, Michelle, boy, yeah. How's it going? How do I follow these lovely women? Oh, right, by destroying them. Oh, by okay. smashing them to legitimate smithereens. To little tiny bits. And here to help thank us judge who smashes oh, the most oh, God. is, of course, oh my gosh, Hi, Cat. Hey, Roxy. <laughs> Back. He came back in. He's sitting there, and I'm looking at him. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's great old times. Uh, Billy stole my hair from when I was here. And apparently uh, our dry cleaning got mixed yeah. up a little bit. I, so I took the pit boss outfit today. So. Yeah. Billy business in the house, too. Yeah, I guess yeah. I'm living Very up to the business moniker today. Absolutely. Wow, I didn't even think about that. But he's not doing the pony. You were doing the pony more. He's now got the... So it's a yeah. different vibe. Luxurious. Both yes. in the beards. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Both Let's talk amazing. hairstyles afterwards. You uh, do my hair later. Billy's she like, we're on a time crunch, okay? <laughs> we will reminisce afterwards. But now we are going to get into this unbelievable fight. Are you guys ready? Yes. 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 Let's do this. I never want it to end, but it has to at some point. <gasps> what was the best TV series of 2017? That is the question. Yeah, we are starting with you and making our way around the table. Mm. The answer is, of course, The Handmaid's Tale. Yeah. Good choice. <laughs> Thank you. You may have forgotten, Roxy, but I just say the name. Oh, right. You're a mic drop kind of gal. Stacy. what oh, do you okay. got? Ah. Oh, gosh. Okay, well, I just want to say, looking at the television series options for 2017, I was really excited and proud of the female-driven stories we were presented with. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I got to go with Glow. That's right, you guys, the gorgeous ladies of wrestling. Um, for the other choices we had today, my fight was, I mean, it's hard to go against them, but I picked that because it transcends going for a specific genre or targeted audiences and can really appeal to everyone. When you talk about TV series appealing to everyone, uh, you're going to have to go with my choice. And I was actually a little bit lucky with mine because unlike these other two series who are in their infancy, mine had three series beforehand to kind of prove its worth and is in series four, Black Mirror. I mean, really, this kind of series, it just transcends everything. It goes from comedy, it goes from sci-fi, it goes to horror, and it just kind of all encompasses. It's such a great show, and it was my favorite for 2017. All right, now crush each other. All Completely. right, so here's the problem <laughs> with Black Mirror. Yes, it has these different elements, but this season, from two, the 2017 season, was one of the most highly anticipated seasons and one of the most disappointing seasons. The episodes were mismatched and, and the vibe was wrong and it felt like they the, the show has already jumped the shark. Talking about Glow. No, no, no. First, first of all, <laughs> I'm going to jump in here because first of all, the three BAFTAs, the Hugo Award and the Saturn Award, it's already been nominated for and or won, kind of already proves you wrong. And personally, I'm waiting for the 2018 Emmys because guaranteed it's just going to jump and keep going even more than it did back in the 2017. You'd like to talk about awards? As soon as we're talking awards also for a about, if you're talking about it being disjointed, they had an entire thing in the very last episode of Black Museum where they're showing all of these different aspects from the other episodes proving that it can really be one of the same universe. They had the DNA scanner from USS McAllister, they had the Archangel tablet, they had the bathtub from Crocodile. It really proved that it was an overarching series. It wasn't just like standalone little episodes. Let's forget about these two downers for a second and talk about <laughs> the upper that is glow, an injection <laughs> of fun, you guys. I mean, you've got everything in the series. Comedy, drama, a little action in there, 80s nostalgia, which is very on trend right now, and it has beautiful Beautiful relationships, very dynamic between all the women. You've got friendships, you've got betrayal, you've got very serious issues like adultery and abortion being touched on. You got Mark Marin, the you know dad of the series. He's like the distant dad I never had that I really wanted in my life. <laughs> so you, you wanted have a that... coke binging dad. Yeah, okay, I did. Great. Who yes, tried I'm... to have sex with you in the end? Uh, you and know. I'm sorry, you when know. you're saying it touches on abortion, it touched on it being like, hey, what if we had a fight that ended in an abortion? It'd be great on on the stage. That happens. Yeah, 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 let's talk about time. serious it issues. Have to be let's this, talk about serious issues. The Handmaid's Tale, first of all, awards. Let's talk about that for a second. The Emmy awards, for Outstanding awards, Drama awards. Series. <laughs> Lead actress Elizabeth Moss. Supporting actress, writing, directing, guest star uh, of Elizabeth, Alexis Bledel. So awards, yeah, sorry, we won. But when Handmaid's we're Tale. Actors, when we're talking actors, we can talk Jodie Foster being an Oscar-winning actress, directing one of the episodes, and Letitia Wright, She's not an Oscar who, is now, director. who is now jumping into Black Panther and is just loving my life right now. So, like, I... The <laughs> Handmaid's Tale. The Handmaid's Tale. Handmaid's Tale is one of the most relevant shows on Horrifying, TV. horrifying shows? Relevant and, and a cautionary tale. It is something that we can all watch and go, 
oh crap, this might be happening. Maybe we should do something. Maybe we should wake up and say something. And the acting is outstanding on it. They have one outstanding lead actress. It's an amazing show. It's relevant and it doesn't need to transcend audiences. Audiences are watching it because they want to. They want to see it. They want to know what's happening. And this season of the second season was super exciting. Everyone was ready for it to come back and it came back and they're happy. Whereas Black Mirror, last season people were like, what? this show's done. We're no, done. No, I'm sorry. No one who watched USS Macau uh, USS Callister said that the show is done. It was You're right. It's really, everyone who really, watched Metalhead. Metalhead that everyone referred to as one of the best episodes of television ever. Yeah, and if, this, and if the episode. question had been, what is the most fun series of 2017, I would give it to you. But it's not. It's, no, what's, it's a lot the more than just series fun, of though. So these two series are a great cautionary tale, as you said, about what could happen. But Glow is, is based on real happening. characters, a real show that happened, and it is still inherently interesting. So that's a lot more difficult to take a true story and true people that existed. We already know what happened to that show. We already know what happened to those characters. There's a documentary about it, but we still wanted to watch that story and see what goes on. But you guys, this is just a cautionary tale, and I'm just like shocked and heartbroken at the end, and it's such a downer. I want to be uplifted. I want inspiring stories. You want women. uplifting. All you really have to do is watch Hang the DJ. It's such an adorable <laughs> romantic comedy between the two, and you're really fighting for this couple the entire time, and it actually leads toward a dating app that I would personally want to use that actually matches you with someone that you've already gone through a thousand different iterations with over the over the internet. I don't know what it is that you guys are Tinder. looking for in a show, but what I'm what looking I for in a show, show that's not depressing the entire time and is not fun the entire time, but you actually get to experience both within it. Remember when the mom is stuck in the bear? That's so fun. I love that. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, the Handmaid's Tale gives you a show that, yes, it is a cautionary tale, and yes, it is incredibly relevant, but it is also a show that is interesting to watch. You don't know what's going to happen. It is terrifying and exciting. You're on the edge of your seat, and you're invested in these characters. You cry watching this show. I don't know anyone who's cried watching I cried show. watching Glow. <laughs> Come on. Wow. Well, I mean, so those it's, leggings it's are beautiful. It's a show, it's and then I cried? It's about women. Those it's emotional. Oh, those leggings are beautiful. Oh, and it's a not a story combo. about women. Oh, they they have, well. they have I get nice it. I get it. Bones. They had that 80s uh, blush going on. It was great. <laughs> we can't deny the 80s blush. All you was a good Eric Pride, like, call on me remix, and it was really just a music video from 10 years ago. Oh, dang. That was harsh. Okay, so besides just the performances, because we keep harping on that, and also, like, what makes you cry, why is your show the standalone best show? What makes it better? Because we're describing the same thing. Better performance makes me cry more or less. What makes it the best? Mine's more well-rounded than the other two shows. Those are very specific genres that only like a niche audience might enjoy, but mine is all ages, all genders, uh, people that enjoy all kinds of um, different kinds of films and television. Everything is encompassed in glow with that. Personally, I feel like, as far as when she's talking about Handmaid's Tale being something that might come to pass, Black Mirror to me is always something that is a lot more immediate when you're talking about things that might come to pass. Because we're talking about everything from AI, we're talking about dating apps, we're talking about uh, just the internet in general, social media cues, hashtags being uh, like drones coming after people. Like these are real and immediate things that actually could happen and are actual questions that we kind of have to start thinking about just as a society moving forward. Like who really do we want to be? Handmaid's Tale while very compelling and a really good story like I'm sorry I see is just much farther off yeah. We don't really don't we really don't have like a fertility crisis impending yet. Um, so I disagree that Glow is a, is the one show that everyone's watching and all the other shows are niche. I don't know many people that are watching Glow compared to Black Mirror and Handmaid's Tale. But also when it comes to Black Mirror, um, I think that. Up until literally the last season, it was great. This last season, it, it knocks it off, and it is not the best of 2017. It was, in fact, possibly the worst. Handmaid's Tale was a new show this season. It came out, and it was just draw-dropping. Everyone I know is talking about it. Everyone is watching it, and they're making sure that they're not missing an episode because they don't want to be spoiled. It's it's the Game of Thrones effect. It's the Westworld effect. It's the show everyone's Westworld? watching and everyone's talking about. All right, based on these arguments, based on these mm -hmm. arguments, I want to go over to my men over there. Billy, starting with you, what do you think? Yeah, I think, uh, look, all great arguments, all three of you proving why some of the best fighters that we have in the Screen Junkies roster, but 
For me, I think Michelle was able to take the best of yells and the best of Stacey's and say, hey, my show's got both of those. So my point goes to Michelle. All right, Ken, where's well, your point? Look, I'm looking online here. I got people checking in uh, using the hashtag Movie Fights Live. We got Chicken Parmesan. I like that. Glow is This is their Great nudity name. in it. Uh, we got uh, Patricia Carrillo saying, now that I'm home, I can tweet again. That's good. Welcome to the show. She also says, <laughs> Roxy has both of her TV fights. Guys, but in terms of the actual yes. show, there are some uh, good points. Zach Armberger says, I like Yale's points, but I think she gave up too much ground already. Michelle is killing this round. I do like what Billy said here, where I felt, I, I felt Yale didn't address uh, her show, she was just it, it putting opinions into uh, Black Mirror. And first, the ratings trying to do a little bit of fact check checking, which is technically my job. The uh, Rotten <laughs> to Tomatoes uh, audience scores are holding steady, 93% and 83% audience score, though that is down about 8% from last season. Boom. Ooh. So where's your point, though, Ken? Because unlike before, you, where you didn't get yeah, to I have a the point, now you, kind of now you do. <laughs> uh, I have a lot yeah. more uh, gray in my beard. <laughs> I, <laughs> I would second Billy, and I got I gotta, I gotta go with Boyd here. So since they both give it to Michelle, Michelle, you are the one that becomes the victor. I will say that I happen to agree with my men on this one. It did take the best of both worlds. And when they fought against you saying that there was no fun in it, you threw back Hang the DJ at them. So that is where it's at, Michelle. Thank Boyd you. for the win. Yes. Thank you. And thank you, ladies. That was a very tough argument. Super tough. How's both that of you my favorite shows are amazing. It yes. could be our last TV fights moment. Is this our, does this count as our episode 100? Know, a lot of people were asking if this is canon. I think it's Elseworlds because I'm wearing Kin's hair and clothes. So <laughs> I can't think this, I agree. this is canon. This I've got the old shirt on. This counts. It's episode 100. Okay. <laughs> the fact that this says 100. There you go. Happy yes. birthday, TV Well, if it counts, it counts. We got an a. But that doesn't mean you guys can't tweet and ask for another 100th episode if you want. <laughs> Just saying. Please. Congratulations, Michelle, on your victory. Guys, don't go anywhere because we still have a ton of stuff, including this next thing where we're hearing from a lot of our favorite women in film. Here we are talking about women in film, why it's an incredible organization, but let's talk about some of our actual favorite women in film. Here are some of our most beloved raddest, baddest chicks. The first person that really inspired my passion for film was my mother. I used to watch old movies with her all the time, and she would show me Star Wars, but then also show me the films that inspired Star Wars, like Kurosawa and the serials that inspired George Lucas. But one of the things that really struck me when we'd be watching old films were Mae West and Betty Davis. These were women who were so unabashedly confident and funny and talented and themselves. Even still today, I would love to have one tenth, not only of their ability, but just of their sure fire and will to live. There's a line from a movie that my mom used to show me called Auntie Mame, which is, life is a banquet and most poor suckers are starving to death. Well, these women were feasting every second of their lives. A female that very much impacted me uh, when I saw her in film is uh, Angela Bassett. Strange Days dealt with so many issues and contained it all in a sci-fi thriller movie. It just it made a huge impact for me to not only have someone of Angela Bassett's stature in a sci-fi movie, and I was such a sci-fi nerd, but along with that it had a very strong message, it was directed incredibly, and I feel like it stands the test of time. Growing up, I used to watch a ton of reruns, and I remember watching Laverne and Shirley and being like, that woman is so great, she's so funny, she's so interesting. And one of my favorite movies growing up was Big. And when I found out that Penny Marshall was the same person for both, it blew my mind. She can be this insanely talented comedian, but she can also direct one of the best comedies ever, and that she was able to produce, that she was able to go across all of these different platforms. The first woman in film to inspire me was my mother. She was a film editor before I was born, and so I grew up hearing her stories about working on set, working in production, and she more than held her own in this male-dominated world. I'm always gonna be grateful to her for the film education she gave me, for telling me these stories of how it is possible for a woman to excel in this field, and for supporting me in my dreams of being part of the film industry. I'll never forget in 2003 when Monster came out, being this little girl in Massachusetts who had always wanted to be an actress and watching Charlize Theron on screen be this horrible, hideous character that was Oscar nominated, that was 
just talked about around town and, and having that be unlike anything I had ever seen in terms of female roles in movies. Then I remember being a little older and learning that Patty Jenkins had directed that film and thinking, wow, a woman directing a woman in a movie. That actually doesn't happen that often. Now flash forward many years later, of course, Patty Jenkins was directing Gal Gadot and Wonder Woman. How cool is that for one woman to bring to light these two female stories that were so different from each other, but both deserve to be told? The first time I remember being seen on screen was when I was about four or five years old and I saw National Velvet starring Elizabeth Taylor. She plays a jockey who wasn't allowed to compete in the Grand National Race because she was a woman, but she ends up pretending to be a boy and wins the race. And that made me feel like I could do anything. And it also made me think differently about gender politics and how maybe that shouldn't necessarily always hold you back. For me, one of the biggest moments that happened was recently, it was with Black Panther. There are so many amazing women characters in that movie, from spies to soldiers to generals to scientists to, yes, a nurturing mom. It's rare to see something that represents me on screen. And so to get to have that with Black Panther, there's a reason why it's touched so many people. Guys, we've talked about a bunch of movies that are directed or featuring women today, but there's probably a bunch that maybe you don't even know were directed by women. Movies that you love and I love, we all love, like Wayne's World, Pet Cemetery, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, American Psycho, The Babadook, Children of a Lesser God, Look Who's Talking, Deep Impact, Billy Madison, Winter's Bone, Whale Rider, Persepolis, 13, Boys Don't Cry, Zero Dark Thirty, Sleepless in Seattle, Punisher War Zone, Lost in Translation, Disobedience, Clueless, What Women Want, Belle, A League of Their Own, Girl Fight, Bend It Like Beckham, The Kids Are All Right, Selma, We Need to Talk About Kevin, and so many more. So thank you guys so much for your support because this event, all of this, is just about you and me, all of us movie lovers, getting more of what we already love. Wow. You know what, we told you this is the greatest crossover of all time, and it wouldn't be that without the Collider Gang in the house! Oh, and check out the cam! Check out the cam! There it is! Harloff, Wendy Lee, we got Mark Ellis, dressed like my drunk uncle. Oh, looking great in his Toon Squad shirt. Perry Nemiroff, thank you so much for being here. John Rocco. Hello, everyone. How are you yes. doing? Oh, thank you very and, much. And uh, Mark, uh, before we jump into some Collider movie fights, uh, I just wanted to plug, you got some stand-up comedy coming up. You're going to be at the New York Comedy Club June 7th and 8th. Well, thanks. I mean, yes, you can get tickets at MarkEllisLive.com. That's not why we're here today, Hal. All we're right, here so yes. that I can be casual and Rocco can dress like Joe Pesci right after he gets made in Goodfellas. <laughs> Uh, Nobody shoot me in the head, goddammit. All right, let's do this. All right, let's do this. Here is the question for the Collider crew. Oh, on, on theme. What two franchises <laughs> should collide? What two franchises should collide? And we're going to start off with, uh, from the schmoes no, the cute one, Mark Ellis. Oh. How the two franchises that should collide? Denzel Washington has a movie coming out later this summer called The Equalizer 2, and I thought it might be a nice idea to have that aging action star team up with another aging action star. So here's the premise of the next movie in the franchise, that Denzel, he likes going after these young ladies Ladies, they get kidnapped and they get sold into sex rings. So some young lady gets kidnapped, he goes to save her, and wouldn't you know it, somebody else is going to save that young lady. Why? Because that's Liam Neeson's daughter from Taken. We're going Taken and we're going The Equalizer. Between the two of them, 10 Oscar nominations, two Oscar wins, most of them by Denzel, but it still stands to reason that you want to have a team up of action movies because the way that action movies continue to build and build steam with sequels is when you have multiple stars in them. You can only be a lone wolf for so long, Hal. That's why an equalizer in Taken is going to be boffo bo box office for both of them. That's like Lethal Weapon, except they're both getting too old for this shit. <laughs> uh, Perry. <laughs> All right, so rather than take the approach of this thing is the same as this thing, so make, let's make this thing, same thing all over again. I want one franchise that's going to shed some new light on another franchise and vice versa. So that's why I'm going Final Destination 
and Star Wars. What? I love that Death Troopers book. I want me a Star Wars horror movie. I love Star Wars, I love horror, and there is something about the concept behind the Final Destination movies and the idea of death design that really could speak to the idea of the Force and using the dark side of the Force. Like Yoda said, once you go down that dark path, it's gonna consume you. So I want a new Force user, and I want that Force user to dabble in the dark side, set off death, they have the premonition, they come back to, they rescue a whole bunch of people, and then they go back in because death is coming back around to get them again because they are consumed by it and they are screwed. And obviously with Final Destination, half the fun of that franchise is the big meltdown that happens at the beginning. And look at all the different landscapes. You could have some new fun. You could have a Star Destroyer crash. You could go small and set it in a cantina. And then there are so many possibilities for each individual there. kill after that. <laughs> <laughs> this guy with horror. Who who's teaching you about horror right now? You are, but that's not nothing to do with the fight. Are you good? All oh, right, we all right. Get there. Wow. Wow. A, a very interesting combo, uh, John. Um, I see you took uh, advantage of the merch Listen, table. I, I, uh, if the judges are watching, I just want to know. I appreciate and love screen. Those judges. will all there be up go. on eBay after yeah, the show. Damn right, yeah. John. What's... Yeah, uh, for me, I, I like I love both of these choices. I'm not the biggest fans of them, but I love them. I respect these guys. But like for me, it is. <laughs> Matt Damon's Jason Bourne combining with Daniel Craig's James Bond. That's the combination. Those two have been incredible and revolutionary in the spy genre, revolutionary in these type of movies, bringing them back to life, making a lot of money at the box office. Yeah, they don't have a lot of Oscars between them, but they're respected and loved by the public. You put them together on a mission, maybe trying to find out what actually happened to my man Jason Bourne, what actually, what, like the whole, you need to go behind the scenes of what, who is really James Bond, who is Daniel Craig's actual character. We went to that Scottish uh, mansion, whatever that was, out in the middle of nowhere in a swamp. We want to find out more. These two on a mission to figure out what their actual real identities are, and the audiences will be gripped, and they're fantastic. And those movies, of those four movies that they've done, have made a lot of money at the box office. So this Bothell box office argument is already null and void. So we've got two incredible actors who people want to go and see, and it would be fantastic. Plus, Skyfall, one of the best James Bond movies ever made, and Bourne Ultimatum, one of the best Bourne movies ever made. All right, we got three interesting combos. Fight it out, y'all. I hope you have a hundred million dollars to pay Daniel Craig because he already mm -hmm. said he doesn't want to come back and be James Bond again. He's and Matt Damon, back to old Danny Boyle. Yes. Matt Bond Damon went on the record to say he's not going to be in any Bourne movie that has anybody else in it. Matt Damon wants to be the sole star, whereas Denzel Washington and Liam Neeson mm -hmm. have proven throughout their careers they can team up in an ensemble role, yeah, but and that's helped them win. You're going to need to get two walkers for both of them and a medic on site the whole time. It's ridiculous. Plus, the the uh, Taken movies have gotten worse and worse and worse. And your pitch is that once again. Liam Nost lost his daughter. Once again, his daughter got taken, well, and Equalizer's has got to step in and take it. Both of your things sound dad. like the same exact thing happening all over again, which is why I kind of hit the snooze button when I hear both of your pitches, because mm. what I want in two franchises colliding is something fresh and different. I agree with Roca, because did you see The Commuter? They can't cut around Liam Neeson anymore. Yeah. He is so slow with the action, that's and there's no getting around it. That's why he goes back to the well that he wants. And you talk about hitting the snooze button. If I'm Lucasfilm, that's hitting the panic button, because Lucasfilm has learned from The Last Jedi, you do not mess with canon, or else you're going to piss off the fans. If you bring which, death into the, if you bring is, the Grim Reaper you start into Star Wars, Wars. Which is why, start... if you go horror, horror R-rated Star Wars, Final Destination is the best possible idea because the whole point is that death's design comes full circle. I don't want to see have Jedi's to have a dying all the time. Character, and it they're no gone sense. and it doesn't affect anything else. Plus this idea of horror, oh they're trying it already. It's called New Mutants. How many times have they pushed that back? There's no logical sense of throwing horror into these franchises. Well, let's be honest. Oh, oh, all, all, of these, no all of these crossover ideas are a little well, desperate, okay? Movies. Well, we, all well, three, three of these them. ideas are desperate but Lucasfilm and Star Wars is the one that doesn't need the desperate. We don't need to team up with Final Destination. Why? That's like letting Rudy play for the New England Patriots. We don't need to lend a hand you want to, to the weak Desperate is going to 68 year old man going back to a franchise he's messed up already three times with hey, terrible look, movies. Say what you so want, what but, but the Equalizer, and, equalizer and Taken too. have not closed in their loops in the same way that Daniel Craig does not want to be James Bond anymore. Well, Matt Damon has closed again, the loop on, top, on top of Trump, that, you're lying. Matt, Daniel Craig already Matt said Damon, he's coming back for Bond 25. Matt Damon also tore apart the James Bond in character. In 2009. There is no chance he would yeah, ever well, join forces with James Bond. Well, Matt Damon maybe doesn't have room to talk about tearing apart the misogyny of a character like that. This is ridiculous. 
Jonas. So what you've got here, Matt Damon is great, fantastic in the Jason Bourne movies. He's exciting. He's still young. Audiences still come to see his stuff. You've got uh, you've got Daniel Craig's James Bond coming back. He already said he's coming back, so that argument is mute. He said he's going to come back and fight and, and do James Bond for Danny Boyle, 25. If you bring him back and Jason Bourne, then you've got he might sign up for even more Bond movies because you've got him something new. You've injected new life into the franchise, and that works. Final Destination makes no sense. I don't want to see Tauntauns eating Jedi's every other thing. Oh, they 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 oh they opened the thing and then they got a, a lightsaber in their face and died. It makes says, no says sense. The There's guy nothing who exciting about that. Closes the door on the horror franchise until he sees something that he likes because it's a little You're different. Using, that's goes, an oh, argument that nobody knows. A, yeah, well, it isn't. It's an argument that you've already made clear. It's sitting at this table. Well, Anything final, related to the horror genre, he'll shoot down no matter what. That's not true. That is the whole point of growing franchises is, is tapping into new things. Look at what we're constantly talking about with Marvel. How they're trying different things with Winter Soldier and all and different things with comedy. Yeah, but they're not doing that's horror. What, that's the point that Star Wars is going to hit, is that eventually they're going to need to branch out and try new things no matter what to keep the franchise going. They found success with it in the Death Trooper book. There is so much fun ideas to explore that one, fit within the rules of the Star Wars film franchise, but two, appeal to the horror genre. And you know what? That brings a whole nother audience into that franchise. But my, my things are already vibrant. Horror, the Final Destination is a done franchise. No, it's not. Star Wars is on its ropes All after Last Jedi. Your All franchises are vibrant. You got well. two old men giving me a You've had was, 30 what, movies to get it right in your two franchises. What are you talking about? And the I didn't say franchise. I said Daniel Craig and James, James Bond. Bond Very is a done character that Daniel Craig no longer wants character. to play. He's going to do it for Danny Boyle Once again, and then the guy is he out. He already said he's mm -hmm. coming for Danny Boyle 25 and he's going to stay if they do a good movie and that's what's really important. And both these guys are vibrant. They're actually happening right now. They're both time. Time. Oh, time. Wow. 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 Is it the septuagenarians? Is it Final Destination, a Star Wars story? Or Double B, Born and Bond? Let's go to Christian Harloff. Well, I do want to say that the fans are giving a lot of great suggestions here. Uh, Amy Awesome said a Fast and Furious franchise and Cars would be interesting. <laughs> oh, oh, nice. Uh, Project Advance says a John Wick and the Terminator. Yes. Ooh. I love that. Yes. Um, there were some really there were some really fun ones that I saw a lot of the fans do. And I think that there's some really great arguments made. Um, I think that j j although the Daniel Craig comment, the only fact that I saw there was that Daniel Craig did say he did want to come back, whether or not it's kind of speculating that he never wants to do it again. But it's one more movie is my point. Right. He's not it's coming not back after debate, this but movie. He, okay, but he's, he does want Actually, to come back. Um, that's that's no, the only thing. Otherwise, I thought they were pretty good. I, w I will say as far as hearing all their pitches, mm -hmm. um, when Perry was said Final Destination, Star Wars, I said, that's going to sound ridiculous. And I think that she fought for it very well. I think that she didn't just... For my, the way that I heard it, it wasn't really necessarily just about the movies themselves. It was about the general idea of what Final Destination is all about. And combining that with Star Wars, I thought that was a really good argument. And I don't think the other fighters kind of combated that at all. I think it could have. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I, I, and, you know, the, 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 to be honest, I think Roka got annihilated. <laughs> what else is new? <laughs> all right, she's back to Mary. Wendy, thoughts? So, all right, when I first heard uh, the equalizer and what is it taken, and then I heard Bon and Born, and immediately I thought, well, that's not really, yes, it's colliding, but it's two of the very similar things together. So when Perry said Star Wars and Final Destination, I kind of went, what the hell is she thinking? And then as more she explained it, I was like, you know, I could actually see this working. Not to mention, I do feel Liam Neeson and Denzel, I love them both, but they are getting a little bit older, action scenes are not going to be as cool, and you put the two of them together, I don't know. And I just can't see Bond and Bourne working together. I just don't feel like these two, as, as actors, would be, even be able to get along on set. Well, that was the thing, though, is that I like that pitch of Bourne and, yeah. uh, and Bond. I just, don't, I just think that they came back at you stronger. I don't think your arguments were strong enough as far as why it should happen, because I liked your, I liked your initial pitch yeah. the best out of the three of them. I just think that Perry fought for it the best. All right, there you have it. Both the votes go for Perry. Perry Nemiroff, she is our Collider yeah. Movie Fights champion! You have to go through a list of my favorite horror movies. Perry, well played. Roca, <laughs> meh. Yeah, Elvis, okay. Yeah. Uh, don't forget to see this guy at the New York Comedy Club June 7th. I should have gone with one. Harry Met Sally meets Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Oh, oh, too little, yeah. too late. Yes. Let's head out to the balcony for a reunion of Flash and Friends. Check it out. Amen. Hey guys, welcome back to Movie Fights Live. I'm Joe Starr. This is Roxy Stryer. And we were asked to kill some time with Marvel's Tony Revolori. Hey, buddy. Hello. 
Well, we just realized this is sort of a Flash and Friends reunion. Now, 100%. You didn't even know you were a part of that, but Flash no. and Friends, here you go. I love it. And I, you I play a Flash. I play a Flash, sure. So uh, we have two questions. One is, is Flash still alive? Barry Allen is still alive, yes. As far as in the Justice League, I, I believe he's still alive. Okay, well, then if Barry Allen is still alive, is Flash Gordon still alive? Flash Gordon, um, I think the song goes, Flash Gordon is alive? Ah, uh, yes. yeah. Ah, uh, no, so perfect. I think he's alive. As for my personal opinion, as for if Flash is still alive in the MCU post Infinity Wars, this is not confirmed. This is not me saying anything. This is just my own speculation, my own thoughts, just because I want to have my own thoughts. He died taking a shit in the toilet. Okay. That's my... That's 100% my. confirmed. No. Flash Thompson died on the toilet. Someone tweet Kevin Feige. No, please. 110% confirmed. Death Dissolved. by toilet? Are you for real? 100%. That is the worst death. He died, on the, the he died on the toilet stone. That's one well, of the stones. I, I mean, who wouldn't want to die on the toilet? You're peaceful. You get some release. It's like, you know... You're done. You're playing Angry Birds, you know? This is what happens when they tell us to just stretch. Is toilet We're stone like a kidney stone? <laughs> what? Is that what a, a toilet stone is? And by the way, toilet stone totally brown colored. But um, shh, like poop. I love you so much, guys. We have some uh, we have some donors to call out. Christian Jackson, thank you so much. Jason Dolan, thank you so much. John Roca, you're in my shot. Thank you so much. Chris Cassidy, thank you so much. And Danny Petruska, thank you so much, you guys, for donating. You can still donate. Go to uh, screenjunkies.com slash backslash charitable event. And make sure you donate. I think we can hit 45. I think we can hit 50 today. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this. Dude, thank you so much for doing this. I know. It's you're busy. I would love to do I mean, like, listen, I love women in film. I think it's great. I recently worked with a, a, a female director, Hannah Fidel, and she was phenomenal to work with, and she has hardships, so, you know, it's hard for a female director or female producer, anyone in the industry, because you're giving so much crap just from the beginning. So it's 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 Amen. my honor to help Amen. in any way I can. Amen. Amen. End is the beginning. You guys, uh, we are going to go back to Sasha on the couch. She's got the crew of Gamer Fights. You guys, take it away. If this is any indication of what's going to be happening in this fight, this couch is chock-a-block with bad ideas, and I can't wait to introduce you to all of them, starting with Spencer Gilbert. His body is a stretch goal. We've got <laughs> OMG, it's Firefox, Pamela Horton, Matt Robb, Game Over Greggy, and Nicole Z, our gamer fighters. You guys, games versus movies. What is actually more difficult to fight? Ooh, I, I don't know. I would say games. I would Why? say games because there's more there's more complexities to it because you you involve yourself in the game and you're the one kind of narrating it whereas you know you're watching a movie it's already narrated for you. Ah, it's just lazy. That's what it is. <laughs> Everybody always says Citizen Kane is the greatest movie of all time. So Pam, what is the greatest game of all time? Uh, well, I mean, people are probably going to judge me for this, but my favorite game of Whoa, all time... Whoa, you think someone's going to judge you on the internet? <laughs> yeah, nobody does that. Yeah. Um, no, my favorite game of all time is Chrono Trigger for the Super Nintendo. What, what? Representing those JRPGs. Oh, it's got a good story. It's got time travel. It's got amazing character development. Can't go wrong. So this whole event is about women in film. Who are some of the great women in games? Greg, I'm going to you. Matt, share that mic. I think. Well, thank you so much, Matt. <laughs> cuddle. I cuddle think if we're talking love. about the, you're talking about characters. Characters. Char okay, and Lara Croft, of course. Yeah. Mm. Matt. You, oh, you agree, Matt? I agree. I agree. Holy Lara Croft, 100%. Uh, Peach. <laughs> Come on, guys. Peach. Gone. Yeah, uh, that's true. She just needs to get. She keeps getting rescued all the time. Yeah, all right. Maybe yeah. you know she should rescue herself like yeah. Lara Croft. Are we game fighting right now? Yeah. Let's Who's the oh, just? No, no. <laughs> Nicole, you're gonna be fact checking. What are you looking for from these fighters? Um, I'm looking for facts mostly. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking looking for them to be honest. You know, I want to play a clean game. I want everyone to care about what they're saying. No fists. No, no, no violence. I want diplomacy. Diplomacy. Yeah. Oh. Well, good thing I don't have my diploma. <laughs> <laughs> Spencer, you're sitting here just looking cute. Oh, I want to know, so this has cute. been you guys have worked so hard for this. What does it feel like to actually watch this event take place now? Uh, it's a lifelong dream come true. Uh, well, I mean, look, to pretend that I did any of the work for this is a lie, but it's going so well. So thank you, Billy. Thank you to all the producers. And thank you to the people who donated to make yeah. it possible. Yeah. Thank you to everybody who's donating. Thank you to everyone. That you guys can keep donating. And if you don't put your money where your mouth is right now, I don't know what you need. Because this fight coming up, I am so excited for.
These are some of my favorite women from the internet, from the universe, starting with our host. I'm kicking it over to you, lady. It's Gray Drake. Thank you, Sasha. Isn't she a pistol? (laughs) My name's Gray Drake. I'm the senior editor of Rotten Tomatoes, I have to tell you. I am honored to be here. And I've never judged before. I'm a judging virgin, but this isn't entirely about me. Um, I am joined by some of the fiercest, most phenomenal critics around the web. Everybody give it up. Jacqueline Coley, Rod Cornette, and Amy Nicholson. Yes. And... Of course, over on the couch, very important job. Fact checking is the fabulous Jen Yamato. Yeah! And also Danielle Radburn. Okay, so we're going to get this started. We're just going to jump right in. Here is the question that you're going to be arguing What is the most perfect movie? Ooh. Which is such an ill question. <laughs> Stop. Okay, when I was posed this question, I was trying to think of a film that I was going to enjoy and a film that I was going to be happy to watch and also a film where I felt it celebrated a part of myself that I enjoyed the most, and that's my childhood. So the film that I chose is the 80s one film that we know and love, Hey You Guys, The Goonies. (laughs) That is the film that I chose because I needed a film that not only had action, it had laughs, it had heart, it had people that you really feel for, it had quotable lines. It's a movie that you can watch over and over and over again. If you turn on TNT right now, I'm pretty sure you'll probably find the Goonies <laughs> there or TBS or somewhere in between. It has actors that we've watched, like Sean Astin, Mature, and that Josh Brolin is Thanos now. Who knew when he was like pulling across there? Again, it takes me back to the 80s. It takes me back to a time that I love. And who doesn't want to go on an adventure with bikes with their friends? Oof. Opening argument. Keep going, Ross. Strong. I got to say that when we first talked about this, I was thinking about things like The Godfathers. I was originally going to go with All About Eve. But you know what? There is a lie, and that lie is that popular films can't also be art. They are. And no film, though I love both of the films that you chose, 100%, no popular film is more a piece of art in this match than mine, and that is RoboCop, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If Stefan were reviewing movies, RoboCop would be the <laughs> hottest club in town because it's got everything. This movie is one of the best political satires of all time. It is a deeply profound human journey of a man who comes back to himself and his soul and his humanity. He is Murphy once again by the end of this movie. It is a comment on consumerism. It is a comment on so many things that are as relevant today as they were. It stands the test of time in every way. Talking about the militarization of police, the the privatization of police. You're talking about a world so riddled with desire and want and greed that it forgets itself, that it forgets its humanity. And in the middle of all of that, it's one of the best action movies of all time. It's one of the best science fiction movies of all time. And it features two of the most iconic death scenes of all time. A man melts in a vat of freaking waste. It is a frolicking sharp commentary on on the environment and an awesome piece of cinema at the same time. You guys, I've been through 14 million different timelines and Robocop wins every single time. (laughs) There's no way. Nothing about this movie should change. Amy? (laughs) I just want to pick up all those lies about Robocop. We got to get Amy first. Let's just go, Amy. Let's go to Amy's opening (laughs) argument. Uh (laughs) All right, well, if we're talking perfect movie, to me that means two things. One, It's flawlessly constructed. Flawless, flawless. There's no ADR flubs or whatever. Like going on the Goonies, we'll get to that. (laughs) Second, it means it is the perfect film for just any occasion. It is perfect, it is complete. You could give up all of cinema if you have this film. And if that's the case, there's only one film that we can submit here, and that is The Princess Bride. Because The Princess Bride Mm -hmm. is a perfectly made film. It's got the hunkiest, bravest hero in history with Carrie Elways as Wesley, who like looked to all of film history. He looked to all of the heroes of the past, and he was like, Douglas Fairbanks, I like you. Errol Flynn, I like you. And I'm going to create the modern version of the ultimate hero. It's got the best princess. Robin Wright's Princess Buttercup is not only just like beautiful, of course, but she has no throwaway damsel. Like This is her movie. She's a major part of the story. Just let her finish. Okay. I'm going to let you finish. All right. <laughs> and also, 
it's not even just a movie about their two arcs. This is a movie with the best supporting characters. You got Fezzik, Inigo Montoya, you got Billy Crystal's Miracle Max, you got Wallace's, Wallace Shawn's Vinzini. Like, every small character is memorable, and none of them are overused, none of them are worked to death. And finally, I'll just say that this is the perfect romance, it's the perfect comedy, it's the perfect adventure, it's got the perfect amount of thrills, and no matter what group of people you're sitting with, no matter what mood you're all in, you can all agree on The Princess Bride. That makes it the perfect flawless diamond in Hollywood's wow. Man, okay. All right. Oh, boy. Uh, so look, much. Fight. Yes. Princess Bride is a great movie, but you really glossed over the fact that let's talk about the one-dimensional character that is the title character of Buttercup. She is only there to be rescued. She is completely an object of every single male within the film, for whether it's the prince or whether it's Wesley. And the fact that what she does and how she treats him, she's a perfect example of, like, if that was a dude, we would never respect that story arc. Like, he loves her in spite of how awful she is. And we love her because we love the film. But what makes Princess Bride great has nothing to do with her and Wesley. It has everything to do with the cast of characters around them. I give you Andre the Giant and definitely Ante Montoya. Sorry, say that wrong. Those are the people that make that movie great, but it doesn't make it perfect. And I'm sorry, I cannot call her the best princess. I mean, Shuri is the best princess. We already know that we know one. That. <laughs> we know that. And, and to bring up with Robocop, it's not even the best robot movie That's of the time frame. We had Terminator true. 1, which is not even the best in that series that I would put hands down I beats will... Robocop. And it's not even the best political satire. We already have Starship Troopers for the ultraviolet okay, political already? satire. Wait a minute. Starship, <laughs> Troop Starship Troopers is the although I love it, is a stepbrother of Robocop. Verhoeven And it's it. better. No, Verhoeven it's not. Did it Verhoeven better. did it better. It did it impeccably. And the tr I really believe this. I watch all three of these movies. And while I enjoy all of these movies, and I actually love The Princess Bride, there's a shot of Buttercup in that movie that is out of focus because that's how little she yes. matters. Also <laughs> adding to that, and so it's not perfectly constructed, adding to that, most of what we love about The Princess Bride is very front-loaded. It happens mostly in the first 50 minutes when Wesley returns as the Dread Pirate Roberts, and he encounters each of his challenges. It's all about his adventure. His adventure with Vizzini and with um, Inigo and it ends about 15 minutes in and then we sort of lose Wesley and we realize how much all of this was dependent on Wesley and it's not even interesting so after it, that so after that it loses a lot of the fire that all of what we're quoting is in the first 50 minutes and it's as if you had a movie called Robocop where Robocop wasn't the interesting character but you don't because Robocop <laughs> is an amazing <laughs> character who's okay, a perfect okay, 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 man okay, 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 okay. even <laughs> opening argument, I think you lost this fight because you said that Robocop is the best action film and the best science one, fiction film. I said film. one of, one of, not the not even in the top ten. That's, no, that's not that. I mean, this is not the best of your tiny you're, niche. That doesn't make it perfect. Robocop is an awesome film, but it's also an awesome downer. I mean, when is the moment when you're like, oh, I really want to recognize that I live in like a capitalist dystopia, which we kind of do. Except that the that's web That's when you put that movie on. It tells you that, right, but it doesn't make it perfect because like, when we defined perfect, when we defined perfect, we said what perfect meant was that it was a movie that 100% achieved what it was aiming to achieve, that it stands the test of time, and that you would change nothing about it. All of those things are true to this day of Robocop. I would give it some it better is, special effects. It is, Absolutely it give is it some better special effects. It's funny. Okay, How let me bring it to the Disney. Okay, we're only fighting about. Be I'll buy that it's for a dollar. It's supposed to be scary. It's can y'all, can y'all, this is what I love about this fight. <laughs> Nobody was able to knock the Goonies because you know oh, it is a pure movie of pure let me finish. It is a pure movie of child idealism. And the one thing I absolutely love about it is the character of Data. It was a character of color who was a part of this band of rogues who had agency, part of his culture, the fact that he spoke with his Data. Yeah, not Data. <laughs> You're saying Data's a great character? I'm saying he had agency within Data? He was the smartest. He was the smartest guy of his group. He's way better Data? than our one dimensional buttercup. Look, there's a difference whoa, 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 between whoa, whoa, whoa. being of your time and falling into the bad, poor, horrible tropes of your time. And Goonies no, 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 no. is left best but, but in our look, And look, look, that look. is how much time that we have. Oh my God. I, have I know. I know. We have to go over to the couch. Oh, Let's no. talk about check into the facts, nothing. Jen Yamato. Well, I would like to say that, first of all, I found this ringy bell. And um, <laughs> yeah, it is a fact that Jen loves that bell. Fact. I can fact. tell. <laughs> fact. That is true. That is absolutely um, true. I've spent most of this, this wonderful debate uh, trying in vain to verify, to fact check that Goonies is, in fact, playing on TBS or TNT at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and the results are inconclusive. Okay. Um, uh, I will say that I feel like we spent more time sort of breaking down the Robocop arguments and breaking down the Princess Bride arguments than making a case for Goonies, which I would have liked to have heard. Um, Roth, I would love to support you on Robocop, but Robocop 2 is better than Robocop 1. Oh. Oh. Gabriel Damon of Newsies. And yeah, what? tell me who, because I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Princess Bride. I think that Amy made a really good, well-rounded argument in favor of Princess Bride. I think the gender politics argument is an interesting one to have around that film. Um, You're going to have to make a choice, Jen, your oh model, God, and help me choose? out. Yeah, yeah, girl. You guys. You got to judge. You got to pick judge. one. Can you go you Yeah, go, go ahead, Daniel. What do you have to say? think about it, Daniel. All fantastic points, um, including how dope ringy bells are. This was, yes. I do agree, I would have liked to have seen more. I couldn't get in. <laughs> yeah, I would have liked to have seen more um, advocating for Goonies, but I do think that it is a testament to that movie um, that everyone started fighting each other and everyone, mostly until the end, until the data argument, left, uh, left Goonies <laughs> alone, so I do appreciate that. Um, unfortunately, Amy, as much as I loved your argument, the thing about the no no the no flubs was was clearly um, debunked by by Rothy Pants. Um, that's her name. You can't call her that. Um, <laughs> I, so for me, it was between the Goonies and it was between yeah the Goonies and RoboCop and um, the Verhoeven versus Verhoeven mm -hmm. argument is um, it was a good strong argument, but I have to go with Rothy Pants on this one. <sighs> oh, all, right. all right. So we've got one vo vote for RoboCop, Jen Yamato. <sighs> Pick a side, my friend. Shoot. I know. Well, I will have to say that it forced to make a decision um, filled with the box wine rosé that I found <laughs> on the balcony <laughs> earlier today. Um, I would have to go with Jacqueline because mm. the news wasn't taken down and I, enough to, to shake what we all know about Goonies. Um, however, everybody's arguments against Princess Bride, as well argued as they were by my uh, forever love, Amy Nicholson, uh, did cast some doubt. I would like to explore that conversation further when we have more than 10 minutes. Yeah, and uh, more rosé. But I think for the purpose, more rosé, yeah, for the yeah, purposes yeah. of this fight, I give it to Goonies. Okay, so this is very intense. This is exactly what we've come <laughs> to expect from this event. So we've got one for... RoboCop, we've got one for Goonies. I'm gonna break this tie because to me, the statement, the <laughs> out of focus shot of Buttercup means that's how little she matters. I was like, wow, that torpedo you, Amy. <laughs> oh, it was brutal to hear. It may, oh God, it hurt. And But I think that the passion and the strangely legitimate reasoning came from Roth for RoboCop? Yeah! <laughs> how did RoboCop be the Princess Bride in world movie? do we live in, yeah. Roth? You are the winner of the <laughs> her first choice that shows how great of an argument she was. Also, by the way, both me and Amy picked the Princess Bride and I was voting for like a secondary choice, so I'm just glad I was here. I'm just here to raise She's, women, to raise right. money for women. Yes. yes! And very quickly before we go, let's have everybody run around, give a quick plug. Go. Where can we find you? Uh, at Rotten Tomatoes on the internet, at that Jacqueline on all your social media platforms. High five it, girl. RT yes. for life. RT for life. Uh, my plug is to thank you guys so much for doing this again. This means the world to me. These women are brilliant. They are magical. They are phenomenal. Phenomenal. I don't movie fight very often because I get too yelly. You just saw it happen. I get too dark. So you're amazing. I love you. <laughs> Um, I'm writing for Variety, The Guardian, Washington Post, everybody. <laughs> a new podcast. Um, a new podcast. I do The Canon, um, Airwolf, and I have a new podcast, yes. Unspooled, where Paul Shear and I of How Did This Get Made are going through the entire AFI Top 100. Amazing. And starting episode five, we use a hundred sided rolling dice, which gets nice. Jesus, that's awesome. Cool. Jen Yamato, anything real quick for me Present. over there? Um, <laughs> you can find me on social media at, at Jen Yamato, but I would like to give my plug to all these women who everybody should follow. And also women in film, who I think yeah. is, is really great, really great fundraiser is benefiting, and I think that's like the bombest thing to happen in a long time. So. Yay, Jen. And fabulous Hello. Danielle. <laughs> I live here. Y'all know me. That's Follow right. Follow me on Insta. Help me get that girl stuff. We'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all know my spiel. Follow me on Insta. 
follow her on Insta. Stuff. So <laughs> here's the thing. Now, there, there is text written out for me, so I'm going to go to the page, you guys. <laughs> Very special guest coming up next. In every generation, a scoopster is born, and we just so happen to have the best with us here tonight slash today. Still the daytime here in L.A. Let's go to Joe on the balcony. Congratulations, Roth Cornette. Guys, thank you so much for watching this show. I feel like we've been putting it together for the last 17 years, and it's kind of cool and surreal that's actually happened. We hope you're having a good time. You guys can keep donating uh, to the cause, uh, just like Sharnice Ellington, Wen Jean Yu, Carly Perkins, and Stephen Garrow did. Thank you guys so much. You guys can join in with them. And now for something I'm really excited about, because you guys unlocked it. I'm so excited. <clears throat> In a world of nonstop news and information, it's sometimes hard to know who to trust. But into every generation, a scoopster is born. Armed only with the best scoops, he will rise to meet the challenge of being the Hollywood's insider's insider. That's why I'm proud to welcome to the show the man with the best scoops in town, Scoops McGee, ladies and gentlemen. Hey! How's it going, Joe? I'm really good. I've been gone for a while. What'd I miss? Nothing, literally nothing has happened in the oh, last couple months. That's great. Sorry I haven't been around. I spent the last six months posing as Kevin Feige's dermatologist to get Infinity War spoilers. <laughs> Turns out I could have read the comic books, and Kevin, you should really get that mole checked out. It changed shape, Joe. <laughs> However, committing that legal act of fraud has not stopped me from getting the best scoops in Hollywood. Do you want some scoops? Yes! <laughs> All right, scoop number one. Peter Dinklage from Dwarf to Wharf? <laughs> My source deep inside Paramount Pictures Publicity Department's custodian's favorite Ralph store tells me <laughs> that Tyrion Lannister himself, Peter Dinklage, is high on the studio's list to play a key role in their upcoming big screen rebook, reboot of Star Trek The Next Generation to be helmed by Patty Jenkins over the long Columbus Day weekend before she starts doing Wonder Woman 2. It's, it's four days, Joe. <laughs> the script, which is going to be written by Quentin Tarantino's long-lost twin, Clinton Maraschino, is said to feature a juicy role for everyone's second favorite Klingon, Lieutenant Worf. And Jink and the Dink are excited about teaming up to bring a whole new dimension to everyone's favorite, second favorite Klingon. Can I, who, is, who, who is everyone's second favorite Klingon? Worf! But their first favorite. I, I, did, I did the bit wrong. It's Chancellor Gorkon from Star Trek VI. As they'd say on the Klingon world of Kronos, Bakshi Blokak. That's Klingon for what a scoop. It's going great. All right. Joe, do you want one more scoop? I only have time for one more scoop. One more scoop. One but more it's scoop. a big one. They bought one more they scoop. Want, you bought at least two scoops. It's yeah. like Raisin Bran. Captain Marvel, coming soon to DC. Oh, That's right, this one comes from one of my most reliable source, sources, a mole deep inside the offices of podiatrist Armin Hagobjanjan, located just a stone's throw away from the Walt Disney Studios. That is, look that up, that is 100% true. <laughs> My source tells me that DC is perilously close to luring Brie Larson away from her role as Captain Marvel in the MCU to fill a new role. Captain Marvel in the DCEU, <laughs> also known as Shazam. Turns out that the Zachary Levi-led Shazam movie, already in production, is actually a Shazam. <laughs> Wordplay. <laughs> An elaborate ploy to hide DC's savvy move to win the comic book movie wars through sheer confusion. But the Mouse House isn't going down without a fight. I hear Disney is countering with an aggressive package, including stock options, a multi-picture deal, and a lifetime supply of bunion removals from nearby podiatrist Dr. Arvin <laughs> Hagobjanjan. Let's hope this move keeps Bree free from DC to fight the Kree for Mickey. All right, Joe. <laughs> I hope you got your money's worth. I think I did. That's all the scoops I have. My lawyers have told me I shouldn't stay in one place for too long. The special counsel's after me for my work on the Russian news site, Gorochevsky Gollywood. Thanks for having me. 
Good luck with the events, and I would like to give a shout out to my personal favorite woman in film, Agents of Shields, Ming Na. See you at Barney's Beatery, Agent May. Bye, Scoops. Godspeed, Scoops McGee. You beautiful man. Let's go back to Matt Rob and Gamer Fights. Hey! Hey! hey. Scoops, hey. Scoops. Thank you, Scoops. <laughs> Great job, Scoops. That was amazing. Uh, welcome to the next segment of today. It's a return of Gamer Fight. Yeah. Uh, Movies suck, games rock. For the next yeah. 10 minutes. Uh, I am Matt Robb, former uh, host of Gamer Fights, current host of Gamer Fights in my house. We just don't air it. Uh, we are going to be doing an amazing fight here today, joined with my fighters from Kind of Funny is Mr. Greg Miller. Hi, Thank you, thank you. Uh, wow, we clap for all the other people. Nobody claps for I get us, it, though. That's I get how it. it's going to be now, Couch. Uh -huh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also joining us, OMG, it's Firefox. Yay! Sonia Reed is joining us. And my favorite member of the Toaster Ghost family, oh, Pamela stop. Horton. Yay! And we can't do this without our amazing fact checker from, from yesteryear. Also, a, a co host with me on Gamer Fights, Nicole Z over in the corner. Yay! And rounding out our triple threat of judges, Mr. Spencer Gilbert. Hey, buddy. Hey. Are you guys ready for this fight? It's an intense one. I don't it's know a... why you guys keep asking me on here. Because you're so most, mean. I'm the most passive person. I don't like fighting. That's I not going to... Just, just walk out right now, guys. Just walk out right now. Yeah. She's already like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I just don't want to do that. That reverse psychology crap doesn't work here. It's Gamer Fight segment inside of a bigger movie fight. So watch mm -hmm. out. Here we go. Your question is, mm -hmm. what video game that doesn't already have a film franchise deserves its best movie adaptation? Pamela, I'm gonna go with you first. Oh, okay. So uh, when I when I got this uh, this question, I immediately was like, okay, so I can't be positive about this because I'm coming from a place of frustration. I'm tired of my adaptions of my comic books, of my my favorite books and things like that, just being completely skewered in movies. So I want an experience that I know will translate well from the game story to the movie story. So I went with Life is Strange because it was one of the fewest games that I ever played all the way through that made me cry, that really made me feel the weight of my decisions. Had a little bit of the sci-fi element that had, you know, Max can manipulate time a little bit. You got to see the benefits and the destruction of friendships based on your decisions. It's very real life. It's something that you can actually feel in the game and feel in the movie because one thing that you guys have with your choices is, yeah, they're great games, and I love them, but are you going to get the same experience out of the game as you would from a movie? Just saying. Throwing shade before y'all even get to talk. Ooh. Don't worry. I, don't worry. <laughs> Sonya! <laughs> well. Oh. oh! We got a piece of paper. So Wait, she brought a serious. piece of paper! We are a lot of paper? <laughs> Not, How many wine bottles? <laughs> 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 Wait, nothing's under there. Well, uh, my choice was something that's near and dear to my heart, of course. Fallout 3, no. um, which is an interesting Girl. choice, I feel like. Girl. So um, if cinematic post-apocalyptic Washington, D.C. doesn't do it for you, and if iconic 50s-ish era music still doesn't do it for you, um, I feel like the story is so meaty, and there's so many side quests and so much DLC that you can pull from for different stories, and it's such a morality-based game, and it's like, you know, is this main character going to join? What faction are they going to join? How, it's gonna, how is it going to affect other characters and other companions and stuff like that? And I like how there is no defined, you are the lone wanderer, right? There's no defined main character. So it realistically could be cast by anyone. Mm -hmm. It could be female, mm -hmm. could, be, could be anything. Could, you know, open That's pandering, Judge. Yeah, yeah, I don't, don't know. know. I don't like like pandering today. <laughs> this I'm just a day. Um, and you know what? I, I feel like it's something that kind of, it, it just holds up. He's 10 years later, you know what? War never changes. Ooh. Oh, nice! I like that. Changed. I like the tag. Right that was good. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. Yeah. The tag from the Is game. That from the game? <laughs> Greg Miller, what's your game? Matt, <laughs> three point one million units sold in three days. My game, of course, is God of War on the PlayStation 4. The hotness right now coming from Sony Santa Monica that so many of you are enjoying. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, mm -hmm. we won't spoil the ending right here or anything. I'm sorry, Pam, was that saying you like the game? Oh, uh, no, I love the game. Just making sure, just making sure. I know, I no, no, yeah, it's one of my favorites. It's literally the only reason I bought a PS4. Pam, if you, if you want to mind, this is my moment. Uh, Judges, I'd like that put on I'm a permanent re record. I'm reinforcing. What I'd like to say here about God of War, everyone listening and watching, is this. It took Kratos. A character who was as one-dimensional as a character can be. I scream every line I have. When I need health orbs, I have sex with a woman. I b just beat things up, you don't know what you're doing, and gave everything a purpose. Here he is, 
A father, suddenly on his own with this boy. How will he raise the boy? How many times will he say boy? He will take him on an <laughs> epic journey. That sounds simple. Let us get to the top of the mountain, father. We need to get there and spread the ashes. That's it. But the shenanigans they'll find along their way. That is where the movie becomes the movie. Kratos, I'm casting as The Rock, of course. Oh, it's about time no. to give him okay. some depth. The Rock as well, a character, right? He needs work. A, a character oh, actor who just keeps Whoa. getting put into the most actiony things. I'm going back in time for Atreus. I'm getting Corey Haim from the Goonies era. I want <laughs> Goonies character. Oh, Corey Haim back in time. Here. Exactly, got exactly. Got it, got it. For the Stranger, one of the first big fights. You know the fight, amazing <laughs> fight. We're bringing in Sir Ewan McGregor. And we're getting him jacked, all right? I mean, I'm gonna come in with cheese and just grate it on these abs for you, McGregor. For the head, uh, Mimir, and I'll just run this whole show if you don't no, mind. No, 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 I we're mean, bringing it, we're I'm gonna stop you when I don't like I don't know where <laughs> I don't know where this man went, but we need a voice for Mimir, right? Uh -huh. We're gonna go find Mike Myers, and he's just gonna do the Shrek voice again. From Halloween, no, okay, Michael. No, 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 no Mike Myers from SNL and Shrek it, and stuff. It, and it. that's why God of War will be the best video game there movie of all go. time. All right, all right. right. Uh, Life is Strange, Fallout 3, God of Four. Guys, what's oh going God. on? So oh, I fight! Think, <laughs> I think my biggest issue with Life is Strange is we've already got that movie. It's the butterfly effect. Ooh. We've already had that movie. And I think my biggest issue with God of War sure. is that, I mean, it's beautiful. Thank it's an you. It's amazing name. Uh, but I, I feel like, you know, you got your father, you got your son. Where are the ladies at? A uh, Freya right there, who I'm casting what? as Evangelina Lily. Thank you. Thank well, you, everybody. Thank okay. You. okay, but for starters, uh, Fallout 4, all the Fallout games have been an experience that the player has because they customize the game to how they're going to play. How can that translate into a movie? How can you create that same feeling in a movie? Pam, could you make it any easier to say why your game shouldn't be a movie? Both of you called out the decisions and the choices you make. But As linear, a movie goer, I will not be making choices. No, no, linear storylines. You are choosing between actual storyline options that end up in a different, you know, like an end showcase. Like, you have this end story from your decisions. It's not like, well, I'm just going to go kill an entire faction just because I feel like it today, and then I'm going to go back on a save. You can't do that in a movie, and that's what part of the fun of Fallout. But I think that's why it's interesting, because it's like, as you're watching it, you're like, oh, are they going to go with the Brotherhood of Steel, or are they going to do this? and it kind of it kind of leads you on that journey but too. then you would just sit there in the movie and go i would do this differently exactly and that's what it will do with life is strange as well but we're also are talking chloe, are it's chloe and max are they ended up together <laughs> are they friends are they lovers what but is it gonna be about, Pam? what no. side of the fan base are you going to alienate initial, tell me right now 50 percent of your argument was who you were going to cast it wasn't talking about the story of god of war we're, you're talking about how the story of the this god of war we're talking about right now it doesn't even touch base on the fact that this is a kratos that has existed in a storyline before Four, I want to know about the original story and people are going to be able to hey hey but people aren't going to be able to get that same experience because part of the the allure of the things you guys are talking about are in gameplay flashbacks mm -hmm. flashbacks yeah, preposterous yeah. no I'm you guys that is God of War seriously one of the best games ever and I Thank love you, it it really oh I like seriously love that game yeah but I don't think that I would love a God of War movie and I don't think I would mm. love a Fallout movie but I think anybody that I saw for Life is Strange together we'd all leave the theater crying feeling like I remember what it was like in high school to have how the weight of a situation oh this person was uh, bullied this person was forcibly put into this situation you have the emotional weight there is no emotional weight to the part yeah, what are you talking about for like, god of war there's no emotional weight no spoilers well, I mean, we already <laughs> talked about it. Well, I already said he had his, the, the mom's ashes need to get spread. If you haven't played God of War that far yet, it's literally the first ten yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. get off the, you know what I mean? <laughs> get off strange. the pot on it or whatever. more like episodic? I, that's, I feel like I'm talking about the original like Life is series. Strange, not Life Before the Storm or anything where mm. the original Life is Strange. Yeah, which is also episodic. Yeah. And also relied on your choices and to make you care about it's it. It relied based. on the choices. It's story based. Which ending are you picking? Which side are you alienating? Mine has a clear point A to point Z. And we have a bunch of fun stuff. It's in it's point a point point either way. Excuse me, miss? Mm. Excuse me, I miss? I think it's a very linear. It's not like it's not like an open world. There's not a lot of exploring. There's not a lot of things you can pull from. It's like, oh, I'm going to go do it. I'm going to go up the mountain. I'm going to do this. Oh, I'm going to fight this. Oh, your Fallout movie is going to be four hours just wandering off. Well, that looks like. <laughs> something over there, wander, wander, wander. Yep, it was. I killed a mole rat. Yeah, exactly. Another mole rat. Awesome. You have the possibility for great moments in your Fallout game. Yeah. I'll give you that for sure. The robot underneath the White House that thinks he's Thomas Jefferson. You <laughs> kidding me? But here's the thing. What well, again? Fallout Three? <laughs> you haven't played Fallout what? Three? It's been sitting oh, on my for shelf. Ten years. Your character, right, isn't an interesting character. You make your character interesting. How are we gonna go into this character on screen and have them make the choices that matter to you? Are you gonna save the feral ghouls or kill the feral? 
ghouls. What are mm-hmm. you going to do? Yeah. How are you going to? It's, exactly. it's too endless. Exactly. Just, right. like right. just like life is strange. Just like life is strange. It all matters on choice. One final argument. And in this final argument, I want to know which ending you are choosing because this is your movie. Thank you. We are going to alienate a lot of fans here. There's only one true ending. <laughs> okay, but my final argument is if you were casting for Kratos, he is one of the most prolific gamers or ga- characters in a game <laughs> ever. Okay. He is, oh yeah, totally. Dude, plays. his Fortnite he scores. He <laughs> um, but I don't know if you've seen the hype around uh, Jason Momoa saying that he wanted to play Kratos, and I think that would be by far the best Kratos ever. Okay. Just saying. Okay. And you go for The Rock, who is literally turned down no movie ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why it's time to put The Rock on the map with a movie that shows his emotional range. Oh, he, mm-hmm. we've seen plenty of his range. His emotional but range. We're, we're done. Tooth with, but, fairy. Whatever. All right, all right. We've got everybody's arguments. Nicole, any anything I'd out like, here? I'd like to point out she didn't. Pam did not she say the ending she chose. Because yeah. I don't. If I if I commit to an ending before the movie comes out, then I'm going to be disappointed, and I want to enjoy him. Just that. like all the gamers who walk in and don't get the ending, <laughs> Chloe. Would have you wouldn't let her die. Max wouldn't let her die. Screw Arcadia Bay. It was the one true ending. I don't care. Okay. The chair goes very far. It does very far. You wouldn't <laughs> die. Nicole, any facts that were wrong or you think were better? Two facts I want to point out. First of all, Pam said that she does not like fighting. I think after this, we can prove that that is incorrect. Mm, yeah. Factually, I didn't enjoy any of this. <laughs> I did, so I enjoyed this. Uh, another one, uh, Fallout has more uh, more music from the 40s and the 50s. I don't know. Ooh. I said 50s-ish, to be fair. <laughs> uh, okay, it's a wide range. Is 50s-ish. Don't argue the judge. Uh, and um, I just want to say that I think everyone had really great arguments, um, but I, if I have to pick, is it time to pick? Uh, well, one fact, uh, the stranger's name is Balder, and he's way too young. I don't want to spoil it. Yeah. Yeah. When, he's introduced, he's, when he's introduced, he's introduced as the stranger. Mm, wow. Incredibly uncool. I want to fact right now and say that that was really uncool, Matt. All right, so yeah, one <laughs> Thank point you. from Greg. Thank you. No, Matt! <laughs> right. uh, so yeah, let's let's go through some picks. What do you got? Nicole, who do you think uh, has the best video game franchise here? Um, I think everyone did a really great job, and everyone should be very proud of themselves. They made really great arguments, but I do have to give it to Greg and God of War, and here's why. It is the uh, grating cheese abs, Um McGregor, and it is uh, Shrek is love, Shrek is life voice, and I think that <laughs> factually that adds up. Well, that's fair. Thank you. I Thank guess. you. Shrek wins. Uh, uh, Spencer Gilbert, what do yeah, you got? Yeah, I, I gotta say, uh, Sonia and Pam, you really brought it, but you never had the counter for Greg bringing up the the player choice aspect and how you're gonna resolve because this is a linear movie. There's only one story with a beginning, a middle, and end. And Greg, you just painted a picture for us. Thank you. It's beautiful. It <laughs> Thank was you, beautiful. everybody. You had me at Jason Momoa though. I got. I, just, come on. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, I'm saying you Get had me at <laughs> Literally, when I looked at I Googled God of War movie and Jason Momoa was like, oh, I want to be in that movie. And I'm like, oh, I'd get behind that. And if he brings it up at the, the fight, I will, I will, uh, I lose. But you didn't, so I do not, I do not <laughs> relent. I do not relent. Got- I want to know how Aquaman pans out before I give him any other True, fair, that's very fair. Very Miller. fair. Uh, well, we've got two votes. It sounds like we've got our winner. It's Greg. <laughs> Great job. Very well fought. All of you, very well fought. Good job. Great. No spoilers. And you spoiled a lot for Life is Strange. I can't play that. Again, if you haven't played Life is Strange, like, it's it's a story based movie. That's fair. But donate first and then go to hell. Right, exactly. (laughs) Share it anyway. Uh, Where can people find you on the internet, Mr. Miller? Oh, you can go to kindoffunny.com, K I N D A. Not like when they put it on the other thing and they said kind of. And I was like, ooh, no, that's no, not no, the same no, no, thing. No, no, no. We don't love Taboo, taboo. No. Yeah. 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 Sonia, where can people find you? Uh, I'm at OMG, it's Firefox everywhere. Ooh, Excellent. Easy. That's yeah. good for you. Yeah. Pamela? Uh, at Pamela Orton 13 all across the board on social media, but you can see my content at youtube.com slash toaster ghost. Mm. Very nice. Nicole Z, where can people find you on the internet? I'm at Nicole Z. It's N I K O L E Z. And I think it's a really awesome cause. And I just think that uh, everyone here should be very proud of themselves. This yeah. is what Yay, yeah. everybody! Hey. Spencer Gilbert, uh, you live here. Uh, <laughs> and I'm Matt Rob. You can find me at Matt house, Rob. Man. Yeah, you, you, you're everywhere. Uh, thank you guys. This has been a very special Gamer Fights. We've had a blast. If you want more Gamer Fights, please make sure to tweet directly at Spencer Gilbert. Oh, begging okay. him to bring the show back. Yeah, sure. Send him as many <laughs> tweets as possible, pictures, all the things. Do it all. Okay. Why isn't the show going through. anymore? Yeah, Spencer. Spencer Gilbert, it's your what fault. What did you do? Oh, yes, Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Spencer. That wasn't enough money. Not enough right. money, boy. Thank you guys so much. Bye. 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 You don't get. Oh.
Right. Oh, hey, welcome back to Monday Night Raw. And Dan, we have a very special guest on the show. Uh, Give a round of applause hey, for the Candyman. Back again. Thank you very much. It's the Candyman here to give all you kitties a sweet tooth. What's that sound you've been missing? I know what it is. ka -ching. You know, I was staying at Trump's place in Atlantic City this week, and I was getting some workouts in. And um, I got to tell you, while you nerds out there were seeing the new Justice League movie, the Candyman <laughs> was crushing shows left and right. I was in Jersey, but it was more like infinity sure. And by the smiles on their faces, it was an infinity score. Very, very good. I'm just glad, uh, you know, we're celebrating women in film, I think the best way possible with uh, the Candyman. And yeah, you know what? We're celebrating women in film over here. What? Suck it. We're celebrating <laughs> women in film. You got you a bunch of dudes. You got you a Candyman. I'm the Candy Woman. Oh, no. Oh. So, Candy Woman, thank you for joining the show. We really appreciate you being here. You have a bunch of dudes just <laughs> hanging out on Women in Film Day. You know what I am? I am a breath of fresh air. I am what is known as the king size snicker bar when you go out trick or treating for Halloween. All of y'all a bunch of fun size uh, peanut snacks. That's true. Candy Woman's my new favorite comedian. Candy I'm Woman's. With, I'm with her on everything. Uh, Mark, I, uh, you're fired. I believe after that performance, I believe this is yours, ma'am. Oh. No. I shall God help with my life. This has been fun. This has been great. Enjoy the rest of my women in film. Thanks for unlocking this. This is a good time. Let's party. Gotta love that, Nick. You guys, I am here with some of the most incredible humans working in this industry. I love them beyond anything. I'm feeling much calmer after our movie fights, which went very well, except that I was a maniac. These women are charging driving forces in this industry, so I want to get a little bit of advice from them for any of you out there that are looking to get into this field or another creative field. Katie Walsh is one of the jurors who decides which films are going to get the finishing funds from Women in Film. It's one of the things that we talked about earlier in our video. It's one of the most incredible things that they do because it allows us to see up and coming female filmmakers. So I want to know from you, what are you looking for when you are watching these films? I'm always looking for a really unique voice, a really strong point of view. I mean, I think the best films are ones that are personal and specific and people who are true to their story, just telling their story and not trying to please everyone. And I think women's perspectives are so underrepresented in, in the industry that it's so important to lift those voices up and fund them and give them support and money and just say like, yes, go tell your story. And we want to know what your story is and just make it as personal as possible. Alicia Malone! I love this woman so much. She came back to us tonight so generously for one of my favorite fights. Did my hair. <laughs> Look at this hair, first so of all. Fancy. You are so fancy. You have a book out. Let's talk about your book for a little minute. What was one of the most interesting that you things that you learned in your research that you didn't already know about the history of women in this industry? And if you haven't read it, Backwards and in Heels is the book you need to be reading right now. Yeah, well, I was so surprised to find out that at the very beginning of the American film industry, there were way more women producing films, directing films, running production companies, writing films, more opportunities for women than there ever has been since. So I wanted to know what happened to those women and who were those women, and can we take some inspiration from them so that Hollywood doesn't always need to be a man's world? You inspire me every single day of my life. You do. You do. You do. <laughs> oh, my God. In addition to Women in Film that we're supporting tonight, there's a Facebook group that you helped start called We Rally. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's called We Rally. It's made by a bunch of wonderful women like you. We thought we have so many great male fans and viewers and people who really want to support women and they want to do the right thing. So we thought we'd bring together men and women for a Facebook group where we discuss some very thorny issues. We get into some deep things. We also try to celebrate women who are working in this industry. And it just makes me so happy to see these young men joining in on this cause. Yeah, that's the greatest thing of all is that we have a lot of great men here tonight. These ladies, speaking of working in this industry, are champions. Uh, you are one of the best critics I know, Amy. I really mean this. You are one of the best lady reporters. They're making love right now. That's how intense it is. 
I love reading your work because even when I don't agree with you, I'm inspired by your words every single time. So what I want to hear from you is how do you sort of manage the balance of talking about what's important to you and meeting the needs of a business? Yeah. Um, I guess I just trust that whatever I find really interesting will be interesting to somebody else because Matt, that's the best thing about writers is like everybody who writes, everybody who has a voice, everybody at home who writes, we all have a point of view that's interesting to people. Like when people think too much about writing for what does everybody want to read, I think that's when young writers really get lost astray. It's like really focus in on what you find fascinating and that's why we read each other. Not because there's a right answer in criticism, not because there's like a good thing we're all supposed to say, but because what does that person say? Because you're getting in their point of view and you're understanding how they think of the world. And that's what I love about reading everybody. Jen, I have loved and admired you for years and years and years. You go to all the festivals. You tell me what I should be looking out for. What am I looking out for this season? Uh, well, I just came back from the Overlook Film Festival, a genre festival that's now located in New Orleans. And I really recommend it. It's a great uh, festival for horror fans. And I was on jury there. We awarded this Indonesian haunted house movie called Satan's Slaves by Joko Anwar, which I highly recommend, especially if you like movies like Phantasm. Um, and also, like, I got a rep for Crazy Rich Asians, which is going to be a huge movie. I don't think it actually played any festivals, but it's coming out this summer, and I think it's going to be one to put on your radar. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Katie, where can the people find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Katie Walsh STX, and I write for the LA Times and the Tribune News Service. Jen. At Jen Yamato. Uh, at the Amy Nicholson. Alicia Malone. At Alicia Malone, surprisingly. <laughs> and here with us, and we are so honored to have them again. Thank you so much for your support. We get continue to get contributions. Max Rambuca, Gabriel, Mar Gabriel Martinez, Albert Lorenzo, thank you, thank you, thank you. For your support, you can still donate right now. But you know what? You want it. We want it. I'll tell you what my finishing funds are going to. It's Puppet Fights, and that is up next, people. <laughs> Thank you, Roth Cornett and ladies. Wow. We've already had enough show. Have we had enough? No, there's yeah. more. Yeah. And the belt is on the Woo! line. What? I just yeah. found out about this. Yes. Whoa. The belt is on the line in what? our felted I mean, fight. Do not call them puppets. <gasps> That's yeah, right. racist. It okay. Is correct. What? The belt? Yes. We have, we have some very, this is such an exciting fight. Wow. Uh, our first debater, uh, you can find him on Perception Check. Please Great. welcome Cucumber. Oh, thank you. Hello. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank, thank you, you for being here, Cucumber. Oh, oh, very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, what were you doing before you came here today? Uh, well, you know, I was drinking a little bit outside. That was nice. That was fun. I could smell yeah, alcohol cool. on your breath. I well. uh, hope you weren't driving. <laughs> also from Perception Check, please welcome Chunk. Yeah. Hey. Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, um, are you related to Grover? <laughs> No. And also, um, he is a human being. Last time I checked, you know him as hashtag Botanicus, uh, one of our faves, Mr. Mike Carlson. Hi, Hal. Good to be here. This is a thrill to be debating puppets. I've been calling for it for like what feels like a decade now. Yeah, what's um, your beef with puppets? No, hey, I whoa. love Gentlemen, gentlemen. Felted friends. Felted friends. Thank I you. love felted friends. I Honestly, this is the most comfortable I've ever been on movie fights, to be frank. Oh, yeah. That's, that's and nice. I want to say that I have actually brought a friend as well. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Okay. A little I, turn of events. Yes, I have. I, a lot of people don't know this, but I have a son. Did not know that. Yeah. Uh, I thought you were impotent. No. <laughs> Common misconception, but no, no, I'm very potent. Okay. Uh, with you. In, 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 I have a wood shop, as most people know. I'm a woodworker. Oh, I knew you were. And yeah, so my son is a bit unconventional. But unconventional. Uh, he oh. he is from the oh. wood shop, and his name oh. is uh, Pinocchio. <laughs> And I wanted to just say he's here too to sort of offer me support, and maybe he chimes in once in a while. All right, okay. 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 You've, you've given yeah. your puppet a pretty derivative name and look. Yeah. <laughs> well, wow. it's a classic name for a classic wooden boy. I yes, think. it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. I'm so yeah. excited. And again, the belt is on the line. Yeah. Dan Merle, how do you feel about the belt being on the line right now for this ridiculous <laughs> matchup? Dan, I can't. I'm sorry. Why not? How? Why not? And Danielle, how do you feel about it? I'm so happy. Danielle has been, 
like for those of you at home, Danielle has been giggling her face off since the puppets have entered the studio. Yeah. And I love it. Okay. Thank you. Felt it friends. Felt it friends. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. Felt it friends. All right. Here is the question that will decide the next, the new movie fights champion. Yes. What is the best non-human character of all time. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. Let's start off with Cucumber. All right. Uh, I believe the, the only one and true answer is Samwise Gamgee. He is, he is loyal. He's a hobbit. He's, he, he is perfect for Frodo. He supports him immensely. And uh, without him, that, that ring would have gone straight to Sauron. He's the true hero of the story. Frodo uh, screwed up multiple, multiple times. And uh, Sam was there to pick up the slack and save the day. All right, Samwise Gamgee, Sh Sean Astin, thank yeah. you. Um, Chunk, who's your choice? I'm gonna have to say uh, Raphael from the Ninja Turtles. I think he's the, he's that guy we all wanted to be. I know we all love all four turtles because I really do, but Raphael was the guy you wanted to be. He was the one you identified most with, that was, those were words, the one you identified with the most and uh, just flat out the coolest. All right, thank yeah. you, Chunk. Mike Carlson. When I was uh, raising my son on the Italian countryside, um, I wanted to show him one of the classic films, one of the classic trilogies, one of the classic whatever nine movies is called. And I'm talking, of course, about Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And we watched mm -hmm. the Star Wars films together, um, Pinocchio and I. Uh, his mother at this point had left uh, just to leave us alone in the woodshed. And I showed him... Who's his mother, a belt sander? <laughs> Cal, I'd appreciate if you kept those jokes to a minimum in front of the child. He's very sensitive. Uh, anyway... Uh, softwood, huh? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> hey, cucumber. What's up? This is my son we're talking about here, all right? I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah. Clearance you were spin saying, at home, yes, people? I was saying uh, the Star Wars films. Um, and our character, our favorite character, is a non-human. His name is Yoda. All right, and he's appeared in seven different movies, and uh, he uh, kind of eight actually, because it's kind of his voice is a little bit. Well, I take that back. It's seven because his voice is a little bit in Force Wagon, but he's not in the first. This is a character who can do it all. He can raise rocks with his hand. Mm -hmm. He can shoot lightning when he's dead. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. is a character who wields a tiny little lightsaber. He can jump around the Imperial Senate. He offers sage wisdom. And let's be honest, he is portrayed by the greatest puppeteer of all time, Frank Oz. All right, mm. there you have the three mm. choices. Uh, fighters, fight it out. Uh, so you're talking about the same Yoda that uh, turned tail and ran outside of a corridor like the reverse of, uh, of uh, Die Hard? He had no choice. All to right. suck and leave. He lost to General. He lost. He lost wow. to Sidious, and he had to go seek shelter. For the record, I just like to point out that a puppet, uh, a felted friend, made you his bitch. <laughs> oh, I appreciate it. And you. it'll happen again. <laughs> <laughs> Yoda used to be used to be one of our uh, fabricated American uh, fellows, but somehow yeah. just uh, they decided to go with some CG crap. So that he's he lost a lot of credibility with that. CG, mm -hmm. let's be frank. CG is better than puppets. Uh. Okay. Oh. Oh. Puppets can't flip around. It's not realistic when he's flipping around. He's gonna oh. kill. <laughs> When, when he's fighting Count Dooku, you, if you guys were fighting Count Dooku, I just wouldn't believe it, you okay? You was fake fighting Count Dooku on that green screen? You mean killing an old man? Yes. <laughs> I don't believe that you guys could kill an old man. He didn't either. I he got it. away. I mean, <laughs> Anakin killed Count Dooku. He took his two lightsabers yeah. and he sliced his head off, yeah, okay? But, but Yoda didn't. Yeah, so but that's another thing that Yoda did softened, not do. Yoda softened him up, okay? Let's talk about Raphael. He's a hothead, all right? He is somebody who runs off and does whatever he wants. He is a master ninja. Uh, a master ninja, he's 16 years old. His master won't even let him out of the house I, because he's too young. Old. He is such a strong fighter. He is kind of the leader of the turtles. You know, we say Donatello is, but really, who gets stuff done? Da, uh, Raphael does. He wears a trench coat that doesn't even conceal his identity. Let's be honest, you can tell he's a giant turtle. He Nobody else around him does. Nobody else made a point of calling him out on it. People are being polite to him when they don't call him out. 
They go, oh, there's a giant turtle over there. I don't see anything. And That's him, what they're being nice. Yeah, and him flying off the handle all the time really gets the turtles into more trouble than, uh, no, than no, problems it solves. It's just something we all identify with as a character. Being a raging jerk? No, just you know, losing control of our emotions sometimes. I think hmm. that's why he's so important, because he represents all of us. Hmm. I don't want to so set that. That inner that. struggle, that inner struggle that we all, 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 you know, all fight with. And and he he lets it out and he makes us feel feel right. It's okay to sometimes to have emotions. We don't always have to hold it back. But we should hold it back when the Foot Clan is involved. Let's be honest. Right. right. Those are a, t a deadly gang of assassins, and we need to be stable. We need to go in with our heads on a swivel, but we need to be make sure we're making the right decisions. Okay. And he does. Haven't heard a, haven't heard a ton about Samwise Ganji. Because he, he has nothing to tell about. He hit him. his head on a rock at the end of the movie. <laughs> no. I a rock hit him on the head. Then he did not bump into it. He was smashed he, by Gollum. What's the difference? Who he saw yeah, through? He thing. saw through his BS right off the bat. He knew that Gollum was no good, even when Frodo did not. He was prepared to go the distance, knowing that there is danger in their midst, and he succeeded. He I, got Frodo to the top of that mountain to get that ring into Mount Doom for its destruction. He, Frodo didn't need Sam. Let's be honest. Right, Frodo what? Yes, he did. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. He didn't. No, he didn't. Yeah. Spring how? He would have been fine. <laughs> He would have. Find out. He was already. There's a good chance Frodo would have died. Yes. There's a good chance that Frodo would have had to jump into the lava himself, but it would have happened. He also saved him from Shelob, the giant spider. Spawn yeah. of Ungoliant. But maybe they wouldn't have been in words with Shelob was if. What's his face? Had not been in the way. Oh, Gollum leading them to the thing? And if Samwise was not aware of Gollum's uh, 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 duplicity, then. Um, I, I think that, uh, that yeah, they all Frodo's just kind of, not Frodo, um, Samwise is just kind of an accidental kind of guy. He just, he was there because he had nothing better to do, well, and he just ended up at the right place at the right time. He was there because he is loyal and the best friend anyone could possibly have. He okay. didn't want to go. He had to go to protect once, his friend. Once, Raphael was a hero all the time. Raphael Remember was Remember the time so he fought his friends. brother on a rooftop? Like a jackass? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there were some emotions going on, but in the end... They came through, they learned a lot, they became a lot closer. Mm. Yeah, I think he actually helped Leonardo to grow a little bit. Look, Yoda burned the, Sedi the sacred Jedi texts in The Last Jedi, all right? No, he's he a guy who is willing to throw out the baby with the bathwater if it makes sense, all right? Yeah, because he understands how pointless being a Jedi is. <laughs> yeah. What? He just he just proved his entire yeah, existence and profession was BS. Yeah. He's willing, he's a progressive thinker. He's like an Elon Musk or a Jeff Bezos in this era, Time. okay? Time! Oh, wow. Is there going to be a space Amazon in the next If Yoda Star Wars has something movie. to do with it. All right, wow. Quite, quite an argument, quite a battle. Let's go to Dan Merle over on the Dan Cam. Listen, uh, I'm not going to lie. I thought going into this that this fight was a bit of a joke. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> and so I was all ready to, you know, have fun and then vote for Mike. Uh, this was not a joke, mm. and Mike, you just got jobbed by two felted Americans. <laughs> oh! That's right. Uh, and for me, and I'm, this is not a bit, legitimately, by far, the best argument with Samwise Gamgee, ah! along with the cucumber, mm. Thank you. Uh, easily wins this round. Mm. Thank you very much. All right, that's one for Cucumber. Danielle Radford. <laughs> Stop. Hey, guys, I have to do a job. Um, <laughs> um, analyzing the arguments, and this is purely based um, on the arguments, I have to agree with Dan. You all did really good. Like, I found great things about every argument, the things about Raphael being too young and not being able to leave the, the house. Mm -hmm. um, the stuff about Raphael and his inner struggle and that it's okay to have emotions was a great argument chunk. Um, but overall, Cucumber really got me with his Samwise Gamgee. Ah! <laughs> This is your and fault. And now you go to blame your son? This is your <laughs> fault. Now you... Oh. You did this to me. You're like my dad when he came home from work after getting fired. All right. I want to thank Mike Carlson. I want to thank Cucumber. Thank and I want uh, to thank Chunk. Chunk. Per, uh, you can find these guys on Perception Check. And Cucumber, will you yes. come back and defend the title? Oh, hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Let's do it. Wow, very exciting. Mike.
Right. I, yeah. I think you should challenge him one of these days. I'd love to challenge him, All yes. right, maybe we'll see a rematch of that. And uh, this is truly a great moment in sports. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone. We're not even done yet. Wow. Uh, but what an honor to preside over this fight. Uh, let's go out to the balcony and see what's going on in the party. Bye, balcony. Roll it. Hey, guys. Oh, my God. History's been made. Cucumber is the movie fights champion. They just gave me a card that said, Joe, do something to kill time. Hey, guys. You can keep donating to women in film. Like the following people. Hunter Christie, <laughs> Wiley Todd, Emily Spencer, and Meg Hout. Thank you guys so much. If we've got to do like another minute and a half. You good, buddy? Another minute and a half of this. You keep going. Jay, get in here and coach. Come here, buddy. Jay, uh, you know, you're good, man. You're good. Keep going. We got to stretch. The producer said we got to stretch. <laughs> If you want to wait, ladies and gentlemen, look, they said Joe does stuff on a card, and that you know I made a decision. Guys, thank you again so much uh, for tuning in. The show's been like two months in the making. Cucumber is our champion, is our movie fights champion. It's a dream come true. Uh, that means uh, myself, uh, Ed Greer, and uh, who won the second speed round gauntlet? Coy Jandro will be fighting for an opportunity to take on Cucumber for the Movie Fights title. Guys, it's a new dawn, it's a new age for Movie Fights. Thank you guys so much for joining in. Thank you guys for donating. Again, Laura Fiffin, we owe you a huge thank you. Uh, thanks to you, we hit our goal in one day, 10K, all of Doctor Who. We're very happy that we have to watch all of it. Uh, all 27 days worth of Doctor Who content. We're so excited. We're getting ready. Uh, 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 God, Ify, what's your favorite episode of Doctor Who? Uh, I think it's going to be uh, the Don't Blink uh, with the the statues. With the one with their eyes are too dry so they can't blink. Yeah, yeah that, that's my favorite one. They can't blink. Yeah. So they're, so I just started watching. So. Oh, yeah. No, don't worry. It's real spooky yeah. when you see it. No, I'm, I'm just excited to see the episode where he finally gets his medical license. Guys, thank you again so much for watching. Thank you to all our amazing guests. This has been huge. Uh, let's cut back to Sasha Paul Raver on the couch. Sasha! All right, guys, I am here with big fat loser, Mike Carlson, oh, who got stumped wow. by... No, but here's why. Yeah. You're a fantastic fighter. Thank you, yes. But Chunk and Cucumber nice. making that debut. Can we please yeah. give it up for that incredible yeah. debut? Yeah. That was like, yeah. that was so real. And now we have one more huge fight to go. Doug mm -hmm. loves movie fights. We've got Mark Bernardin versus Clarky Wolfie versus Sam Levine. Who you got, Mike? Uh, you know, I'm gonna say Sam. Why? He just, you know, he he wins a lot. I've faced him before. He's a very tough competitor. Um, so I feel like if I have to pick, it's Sam. But these are all great competitors. You well, know, I'm not gonna. Mark's working at a disadvantage because he just did the Marvel Marathon. So he was spent 31 hours in a movie theater. So oh my what God. do you think that's done to his mental state, Spencer? Oh, his mind has got to be just a full diaper right now. That, that's going to be tough to shake off. Uh, I feel for you, man. Uh, how, did, you, did you just sleep during Thor 2? How'd you get through it? Yeah, yeah, you got through. through. That's how that's how we're getting through this. So, now, Emma, yeah. we've got uh, one more fight. <laughs> yes. And with that fight, we have a new judge. How do you think Doug is going to compare to Hal? I mean, listen, everybody loves a Hal Rudnick. I've been friends with Hal for a long time, but, you know, Doug is kind of an internet legend, so <laughs> I am excited to see how this goes. Obviously, I'm 100% in the corner of uh, Clark Wolf. She is my girl. Yeah. Uh, I believe in her, and I believe in Doug to choose the correct winner for this fight. <laughs> Roxy, you chose a lot of really good winners. This is a thank you so it's much. It's so nice to see you back here too and doing TV fights yeah, again. Yeah, dang. I mean, that was cool. And that was because the people wanted it. I mean, you are you are a woman of the people. I am a woman of the people, and I don't get enough credit for being a woman of the people. <laughs> it's incredibly true. Now, if there were to be another TV fight, mm. who would you like to see face off? And would mm. Chunk be one of those people? <laughs> because I feel like we could have a dual belt holder. Oh, 100% Chunk is invited and can take the belt at any time. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that moment, and which Chunk does. <laughs> but I would also say Matt Lieberman held the belt for a long time. Yes, he did. True. He would be great. Dan Merle held the belt for a long time. So there's some really great 
fighters out there, uh, it's a tough call. I want to fight again. I want you to fight again. We can, we can do all of this, but we're so grateful for you guys for supporting this incredible day, this yes. extravaganza. Um, Thank you for being a part of it. Thank you for supporting women in film. You can continue to make donations. And keep in mind, if you guys are watching this like three weeks from now, it's not like the donations stop. You can still do it. You can also volunteer. You can be a part of the organization. But if you want to do anything, I think the most important thing you can do right now is watch some Doug Loves Movie Fights because this is going to get ugly. This is going to get rough, riled, and rowdy. And I'm excited for it. Woo! Doug Benson, we're going to you. Hey, everybody. I got my Tito's sunglasses on. They're not a sponsor of me. Uh, my name is Doug, and I love movies. And this today, is Doug I Loves love Movies. movies. Good job, you guys. Uh, today I brought together some of my friends to uh, have a fight. Let's give it up for Fandom's Clark Wolf. Hello. Yeah. Dum Dum Sam Levine. Thank you. I'm a dum dum. And Penzoil's Mark Bernardin. Yeah. Uh, everybody's got a sponsor. Dan Morell's going to be checking the facts. Who's your sponsor, Dan? Uh, Danielle's my sponsor. Oh, okay. No, no, no that's a different sponsor. That's a different kind of sponsor. <laughs> that's a different thing. Oh, we're not she just asking who you call when you want to have a drink. <laughs> uh, You're doing uh, great. Thank you. Daniel Radford is on the couch. Uh, she's also going to help us out and uh, gets a deciding vote at the end of this thing. But uh, it all comes down to what I think, and I think I'm the best person to judge, uh, to be the final judge on a uh, tribute to women in film. I wholeheartedly agree, Doug. <laughs> Good night, uh, I had a better choice. Yep, totally. right. Are you guys ready for your question? Yes. yes. Clark is particularly ready with uh, several pages of notes. It's very intimidating. Who mm. is the best female movie character of all time? Oh. Wow. Yeah, shades back on. All right. Argue it out. Let's start with, is there a specific order we should go in? Sam yeah. Levine. All right, here we go. I thought long and hard about this. I weighed all the options, and there is one clear-cut winner, and her name is Ellen Ripley mm. from the Alien franchise. Mm. This, she is not a woman you want to mess with. This is a gal who was working as a warrant officer on, on just a, a barge of his ship, just trying to get back home from some moon colony, just trying to go back home. And then all of a sudden, there's a friggin' alien machine. Everything is going wrong on this on this flight home. And everybody around her is like, oh, I know what to do, I know what to do. And they don't know what to do. Ellen Ripley has to take charge. She has to save, try to save as many other people as she can, but they don't listen to her because she's the smartest and they don't know. And, uh, and so she has to save herself. And that's exactly what she does. She gets out on that escape pod and she is trying to not just save herself, she realizes that friggin' alien is in there. She's got to save humanity. If that thing comes back to Earth with her, she knows that it's all over. So she does it. She fucking defeats the alien. Only, guess what? 57 years later to have to do it all again. She is the only one who knows what that thing is like. And she tries to explain to the company, you don't understand, this thing's a killing machine. And the company's like, no, 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 it's fine. We're going to send in armed Marines with you this time. Ellen and she's like no those are Marines they don't know what they're up against I do and she goes in there and she makes sure that that thing does not destroy humanity a second time and then then why are you yelling at me because <laughs> I want you to understand how awesome Ellen Ripley is Doug is there a time limit on this <laughs> you tell me you're the host you're the judge I don't get it I don't I don't got the time I don't know either I'll wrap it up for Somebody's you Somebody's supposed to hit a bell my or point is someone probably is oh there it is oh is that the bell yeah. All right, great. I'll come back to it then. That was great. Yeah, we'll talk to you in a little bit. Okay. Thanks for coming by. Hey, my pleasure. Happy to be here. <laughs> well, Clark Wolf, what's your uh, choice? Yes, sir. Um, well, that was a great synopsis of the first half of the Alien franchise. I got cut off. It was, it was probably the best part of, of Ellen Ripley's trajectory, Thank to you. be fair. I but... can't wait to hear what your thoughts on Alien 3. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Alien Cubed, my favorite <laughs> installment. Uh, yep. So, okay, I was thinking about what makes a great character, right? And it's important. Mm -hmm. Ooh, a thesis uh, statement. Yeah, to think about what defines hmm. uh, an overall character. It's a journey, an evolution, a change, but it's also uh, 
you know, the things that make up this character. It's their look, it's their lines, and of course it is the actor who plays them. So for me, uh, the greatest female character in all of movies is Leia Organa. It's uh, Princess Leia from Star Wars. Um, you know, one of the, the reason, there's so many reasons to to love her, but I think it's, it's amazing that we got to see her journey from princess to general. We got to see this character's evolution from the age of of about 21 years old to the age of 60. So she is a complete picture of a woman. We see her be young and fun and energetic and rebellious. Then we see her grow a little and, and get a little edgier. We see her um, as a mother. We see her as a lover. We see her as a general. We see her as, a, see her as the leader of the resistance. She is a complete package. And at the end of the day, she's real. I think that's why audiences have fallen in love with her over the course of, of five movies, is because she gets to be a real woman, a real person. And so I think there's, there's really no other choice. It's, it's Leia. Okay. No bell for you, because you, uh, you know, didn't describe all the movies. <laughs> I was describing her peril. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, what do you got for us? Uh, what's your choice, Mark? Uh, well, well, damn. I mean, that's that's a lot to live up to. There's a lot to follow. That's that's a lot to come on the heels of. I went with Clarice Starling from what? Silence of the Lambs. Wow. Um, I feel like if you're if you're talking about a female character, if you're talking about a character who is existing in the real world, not science fiction, not alien places, who's dealing with real monsters that are actually the worst human beings on the face of the planet, to find a character like this, to find a character who walks into male spaces afraid but still goes. That is that is what courage is. That's what it's not not being afraid. It's being afraid but still acting despite that. That. And her entire mission is to wrestle the monsters of the world to the ground. She's racing away from her own inner trauma into the maw of people like Hannibal Lecter and Buffalo Bill. And it's her job to make people safe. It's her job to conquer her own fears, to help conquer the worst of humanity. And like, I love both of these other movies. I love both of these other women. But, you know, one of them was a damsel in distress for most of the movies. And the other one was written to be a man. So that's just what I'm saying. I'm going Clarice Starling. I'm going strong. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um, I like that. I like all all of what you guys said. I, I the thing about Clarice is I, I wish she learned how phones work because at the end of that <laughs> at the end of that film she she says Doctor Lecter after he's clearly hung up. She says it several times. Yeah. But uh, but other than that, it's a very strong choice. They don't teach that in the FBI. <laughs> and, but now uh, I'll leave it up to the three of you. <laughs> Okay. To find it out. All right. Well, I want to pick up on what you said, damsel mm. in distress. I would and, love to and talk I about think, that claim. And I think that is the absolutely perfect phrase to describe why Ellen Ripley is uh, absolutely queen among these three. What is Princess Leia's most famous line? Help, Help me, me Obi-Wan. Obi you're, you're my, my only hope. hope. She Sanderino. has to turn to a man, Sans. an old white man. <laughs> And uh, uh, what is Clarice Starling's most quotable line? Exactly, she doesn't have one. What is it? Yes, she was a big girl, sir? No, no. What is Ellen Ripley's most quotable line? Get away from her, you bitch. This is a woman who doesn't look outside for help. This is a woman who knows she has to do it herself if she wants it done. Well, I, I gotta answer the damsel in distress claim when it comes to Leia because I, I you know, I did actually just rewatch all of the movies and and help me Obi Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. Is, is the most iconic line, says you guys. But talk to a generation of women who grew up watching her and watching her grow from being the princess who is in distress to the general who is leading the rebellion. That in, is into, not into the most Into devastation quotable. and doom into, and yeah, disarray. Yeah, it does and not so, end so on a particularly you, happy well, note. And neither does Alien or Aliens oh, that's or not Alien true Cube because, or Alien 4. Because much <laughs> like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Ellen Ripley, after heroically taking her own life to once again save humanity, Humanity resurrected. Yes, but, but to your, Ripley, believe it or not. Ripley, believe what? it or not. But to your to your point, actually, I I like that every choice Leia makes isn't perfect. The question isn't who is the who got everything right the first time they did it. It's who is the best female character in movies. And guess what? Got, we're not perfect. Nobody is perfect. And the thing that women on film have been forced to do forever is be perfect. And that's part of the reason why I picked Leia is because every choice she makes isn't right. But we see 
her deal with the consequence of that and we see her fight another day and we see her pick herself up and keep going. That is what makes an important character. Um, pardon my French, but I thought the saying was, uh, bitches get shit done. She got a lot done. Not so much <laughs> though, really. Our players got a lot done. But the problem is she, she I was... I noticed a... how both men on the table have said bitches and I haven't. Just saying. I was quoting the oh, film. I was oh, These are great, oh. They're great quotes. And my, yeah. is, and my bitch is referring to the female alien. Oh, I know what, I right. know what it and is. And Princess Leia. I'm referring just to her saying. accomplishments. Just I'm saying. quoting Tina Fey. Uh, I, I'm not, not going to disagree with you, but the same could be said of all three of these characters. They all are imperfect. They all make mistakes. They all grow. The difference is Clarice Starling has the benefit of the FBI being behind her. Uh, princess Leia has the benefit of being born a princess and then becoming a general with the disposal of an entire army and fleet. Ellen Ripley has herself to depend on. In the third she has film, herself in her underwear and a cat. That's and right. <laughs> I hate to, uh, I, I gotta jump in because right, uh, they're saying time is up oh. and uh, by they yeah. I just mean voices in my head That's cool, that bro. I should probably ignore. And one, of these one last thing about Clarice because we've... Uh, well, one of these characters Characters led the actors playing her to a Best Actress Oscar. Oh, the only one of the bunch. Well, there I'm you just go. gonna say, just gonna say. True. All right. That is true. Sigourney won for another role, right? Sure. Gorillas in the Mitts. Yep. <laughs> it's about that great uh, baseball team, the Gorillas. <laughs> All right, let's. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's our uh, fight, and we got to go to Dan. For the uh, facts. Uh, yeah, uh, she was nominated for Girls in the Mist. Oh, did not uh, win. Did not win. Mm. Nominated uh, two years earlier for Aliens. Actually, oh, nominated weird. Uh, twice in one yeah. year. She was nominated she was for Best Supporting Actress in, for Working Girls. Mm -hmm. Two years. different categories wow. in one year, so wow. that's pretty strong. Uh, that is pretty, pretty strong. That is pretty mm -hmm. strong. Uh, factually, that's all I have. Uh, I, would that's you like, it? Would you, yeah, that's it. Because they weren't really dealing in facts. It was all uh, just yeah, it was uh, all feelings. Opinions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Not We're facts, emotional so fighters up here. Yeah. 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 It was so. all about a, a strong woman trying to take down a couple of uh, scruffy-looking nerf herders. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm a uh, what do you got for us, uh, Danielle? Well, um, at this point, I mean, again, I'm not doing any of the social stuff, so... This is a good fight. Yeah. First of all, I just have to mm -hmm. say this was an amazing fight. Strong choices. Um, yeah, everyone had very strong choices. I loved Clark's idea of Princess Leia and getting to see like the full evolution of that character. Um, I loved Mark talking about how Clarice um, has to deal with real world monsters and going in when, even when she's afraid. But I have to say that Sam just kept hitting it and hitting it and hitting it with really great arguments about Ripley. Um, not having anyone else, having to be by herself, having iconic line, that, that iconic line, uh, all of these arguments to me were very, very strong. So I gotta go with Sam. Mm. I went the other way, or I went a different way. There are two other ways. What are ways you saying, Dan? One you. of them, yeah. <laughs> no, I actually went with Clark because I felt everyone had a great opening. Like all of you, when you gave your opening pitch, I was like, I agree with that. Okay, nope, I agree with that. Okay, nope, I agree with that. So it all came to when everybody was mixing it up. And I felt like, you know, the quotability thing didn't really have much sway with me. Um, and the award thing is great, but that also didn't hold much sway. And I thought that Clark in the middle really diving down into her character and, and what I admired was taking an attack from one of her opponents and turning it into this is why this is the strength of that character. That's what won out for me at the end of the day. So I actually Oh yeah, the argument about the flaws was great. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, well I guess I've gotta decide this thing. <laughs> and I'm going I'm going with Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the right choice. <laughs> right um, uh, you know, uh, all three uh, characters are super strong women who, uh, you know, like you guys said, with your with their flaws and their strengths, and uh, it's a uh, it's a really rough decision I have to make here. Um, I wish that one of my felted friends was here to help, because <laughs> those guys know how to fight. <laughs> but. Um, I'd have to say that for me, the most enduring character of the three chosen here has to be Princess Leia. So I'm giving it. I'm not giving it to Clark Wolf. She earned it. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> there you have it. That's the Doug Loves Movies fights. <laughs> That's weird to say. Thank you guys for playing and for being here. And let's go to Roth and the ladies of Screen Junkies out on the balcony. Yay! Congratulations, congratulations to Clark Wolf. Thank you, thank you.
thank you, thank you to all of you. The Screen Junkies community is the greatest community on earth, and I absolutely mean that. You have made three dreams come true for me. One, a Doctor Who honest trailer on day one. Two, you have fully supported the Screen Junkies and our endeavors with women in film. God bless you. Three, I have been Team Cucumber for weeks, people, and he is our Movie Fights champion. Congratulations Woo. to Cucumber. Thank you, Alicia Malone. Oh, thank you, everyone. Roxy Stryer. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, guys. Sasha Paul So happy to be here. Every single one of our guests and hosts that has been with us tonight, thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank, thank you, Ralph. 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 Thank you,